acknowledge that this meeting is taking place in the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We're dedicated to honoring indigenous history and culture, and moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, welcome everyone here and at home. We are meeting in person tonight in the city council chambers. We have members of council executive management and the city clerk present tonight due to the physical distancing measures. Some of the uh, executive and senior leadership team are not in the chambers with us, but will be available to answer questions via video conference. And as the chambers does remain closed at the moment to the public, we will uh, have any members of the public joining us tonight uh, for presentations and deputations and so forth, they will do that virtually as well. Uh, before we started tonight, I wanted to mention the passing of Jack Gardner. Mr. Gardner was a, a member of city council. He passed away on October 20th. A he served on Barrie City Council between 1966 and 1970, and on the school board between 1995 and 1999. Uh, one of his major accomplishments while serving on Barrie City Council uh, was uh, Centennial Park, uh, which in, in 1965 really set the foundation for uh, the current waterfront, which is now, of course, considered the jewel of Barrie. Jack's parents launched Garner's Menswear in downtown Barrie in 1931, evolving into Garner Menswear and Sports, and later just Garner Sports, which is how many of us knew that legendary store when Jack took over running the business. Over the course of his life, the, uh, his very active business career and his political career. He was involved with a number of federal and provincial election campaigns, many committees and organizations, very Chamber of Commerce, very Neighborhood Committee uh, back in the day, Ontario Economic Council, Georgian Bay Regional Development Council, Ontario Child and Family Review, and of course, the Rotary Club as well. On behalf of Barrie City Council, to the residents and the residents of Barrie, I wanna pass along our condolences to Jack's family and friends, uh, a life well lived and a, an enormous contribution that was made by Jack Garner to the city of Barrie over the years. The first item of business tonight is the confirmation of the minutes from October 4th, 2021. Minutes uh, have been circulated. Are there any corrections, members of council, to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, they're adopted as printed and circulated. We do have an awards and recognition item tonight. It's been a little while since we've done awards and recognition at City Council, and as we get back into the swing of in-person meetings, we hope to uh, have the opportunity to recognize um, uh, achievements in our community uh, and, of course, from our organization as well. And that tonight is uh, what I will be um, uh, speaking to very briefly here because our, uh, our own Invest Barry Department, our Economic Development Department, won four international awards. Uh, recently, and that is uh, quite an accomplishment. Each year, the three major economic development professional associations at the international, national, and provincial level, uh, through those award programs, recognize achievements and top economic development projects and initiatives. Over the course of 2021, City of Barrie projects were recognized by all three of these associations, winning four awards in total. And tonight I wanted actually to present all four of those awards to members of council and recognize those who contributed to this win because as uh, you will hear, it goes beyond just the staff and invest Barry, but uh, of course uh, the, there are some here that are specific um, to, to work that was done during COVID. <clears throat> First of all, uh, there was a provincial award for the Dunlop Streetscape project. So starting at the provincial level, the Economic Developers, Developers Council of Ontario awarded the city a first place win for the Dunlop Streetscape project under the Urban Building Initiatives category. This uh, project replaced infrastructure underground to support our city's growth and on the surface, transformed the face of our downtown, improving the pedestrian experience, storefront and patio access, and really opening up and beautifying the space to attract more visitors. Uh, this really required a very strong working relationship with our contractors, the downtown BIA and businesses themselves, and uh, to deliver a project of this magnitude on time and with the least amount of, of disruption. So I'd actually like to start by acknowledging and thanking our infrastructure team, led by Bala uh, for your project leadership, Access Barry for the work to keep businesses and the public aware of the project through the We Dig Downtown campaign, 
and to our external partners and contractors, specifically Tatum Engineering and Arnott Construction, who delivered the vision for the streetscape and worked in collaboration with the city to support communications to businesses and customers over the construction period. And of course, tying all that together was the downtown BIA, contributing to the beautification components of the project, as well as supporting businesses throughout the construction period. And I need to show this off. There's the hardware. It comes with its own little LED light on the bottom. But uh, congratulations to the entire team. This is the Dunlop Streetscape project is certainly one that quickly has become a resident favorite. Uh, it, uh, it made an enormous and immediate impact in our community, and it will for many years to come. So congratulations to the team on this well-deserved award. Second one and the third one uh, were for the Invest Berry Recovery Kits, and they won at both the Canadian level and the international level. So in response to the impact of COVID-19 on local businesses, the city's Invest Berry and communications teams sourced local companies to provide the materials to create Berry Together Recovery Kits for local businesses, all part of a larger scale support local campaign. Invest Berry delivered 550 recovery kits to local businesses which included hand sanitizer, face shields, floor and window stickers to help with distancing. And in addition to the COVID-19 recovery kits, the support local campaign included a video series featuring local businesses, social media promotion, and of course, a series of blog posts. Our business service partners, including the downtown BIA, again, Tourism Barry, the Sandbox, and the Barry Chamber helped promote and distribute the kits. InvestBerry was recognized both from the Canada Economic Developers Association and International Economic Developers Council for this program, winning the promotional item category for the marketing awards at the national level, and a silver award in the general purpose print promotion category at the international level. So that's these two certificates. Congratulations to the teams from Invest Access and the rest of the organization. That's the awards there, members of council. And of course, a big thank you to those partner organizations who uh, were part of the broader effort all the way through COVID and continue to be to try and support our business community with uh, the pandemic. Finally, the fourth award is for the InvestBerry website, and that is also an international award from the International Economic Developers Council. In 2020, InvestBerry, with the support of communications staff, in particular Sherry Harris, launched the new InvestBerry website to further its business and talent attraction efforts. Designed as a marketing and attraction tool for businesses and area employers, the website also gives businesses, entrepreneurs, and economic leaders a centralized, easy to navigate entryway into the programs and services offered by InvestBerry. It's investberry.ca. Uh, the IEDC awarded InvestBerry with a bronze award for the website. So the hardware may be a little smaller, but the uh, uh, recognition is international and very, very well deserved. So congratulations, <laughs> Invest and Access. So, um, you know, I, uh, the comment I wanted to make in, in addition to the enormous congratulations to uh, staff that were involved in each of these initiatives um, is that, uh, you know, I think in, in uh, trying to find ways through a completely unprecedented time, uh, a global pandemic, to support businesses and with the challenges of a municipal uh, regulatory framework and fiscal framework and, and uh, challenges of our own, uh, our staff did incredible work uh, to try and deliver things that would help our business community in a meaningful way. Uh, that includes, of course, the downtown construction, the, the, street, the streetscape efforts, but I would point to things like Digital Main Street uh, and uh, the shop local campaigns and so forth. And, um, you know, I think the recognition for doing those things well is richly deserved, uh, but I also wanted to just recognize the, the, the thoughtfulness of a, of a staff team that uh, took the time to listen to what they were hearing and try and find ways uh, to help, even if there wasn't uh, hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of dollars in subsidies available from us, they found ways to help, and turns out some of those were award-winning ways to help. So thank you and congratulations again to the team. Okay, uh, to our business agenda tonight, uh, the first item on that agenda is an uh, de emergency deputation request uh, from the General Committee report from October 18th. Uh, the emergency deputation request is from Chris Franco concerning Motion 21G-238, the Residential Rental Licensing, the Absentee Landlord Pilot Project, and the draft bylaw. 
Uh, because this was received after the printing of the agenda, we do need to uh, vote in favor of hearing the emergency deputation. So I'll call the question. Those in favor of hearing an emergency deputation on this? I am as well. Uh, that will proceed. And so if we could have Mr. Franco come into the meeting. Hello? Hi, Mr. Franco. Uh, we've got you in the call now, I think. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, fellow councillors, and uh, members of the public. I am uh, giving this deputation over a three-year pilot proposal for absentee landlords within the Georgian College area. This is a costing of $756,000 for three years. Based on the staff report, um, they estimate that 650 units is going to be likely the number that they need to register. Out of this licensing number of units, City Council is asking a fee of $967 per unit. Now, I've looked into uh, what the costing will be to get an ESA certificate, as well as a HVAC certificate, a drawing layout. Cost of $2,200 is what a landlord will need in this particular area to be licensed. Um, I've also reviewed some of the licensing uh, staff reports from different municipalities, and there was uh, two municipalities that do service-wide licensing, but in particular, Therald, it was in their view that licensing specific sections of the city was against human rights based on a legal opinion received. Now, I don't know if the city has got a legal opinion in regards to this, but I also looked up the Ontario Human Rights Code, and uh, one of the protected grounds is place of origin. Now I go back to the definition on the Ontario website and it says people should not be discriminated against or harassed because they are from outside of Canada. The code may even cover people from a particular place within Canada. Now we're going back to a specific area in a specific region in the city of Barrie. My concern is, is why is it only in this area? Why is it that we are picking this area and not doing it within citywide limits? Um, it looks like based on the staffing report as well, that the cost recovery on this licensing program is only gonna cover 87% of the total costing per year. 13% has to come from the general tax base. Now, this is only because if you get 650 people applying. If there is a lower level of voluntary applications and compliance, the tax base will have to subsidize more for licensing in this particular area, which is only Ward 1, not all the wards. If owners don't volunteer to license their properties, a significant number of resources are spent chasing owners. Regulations, uh, annual inspections provided in the bylaw requires cooperation and permission for entry, and there are no powers to enter for those who are not submitting applications or renewal licenses. I have a concern about this where we're just needing to get more staff to do the more enforcement. I, I don't believe that licensing in a specific area is going to fix the problem. I believe that what we need to do is hire more staff and have a targeted approach in looking at all the properties, not absentee landlords. Now, I, I was also looking at your bylaw. Um, uh, uh, the bylaw and it doesn't clarify what absentee landlord is um, for one i could be someone in barry that has uh, properties 
in uh, the Georgian College area, but does that make me an absentee landlord because I'm within the city limits or not within the city limits? That's a question I would pose to you. If, uh, if the city does propose to go ahead with this bylaw, I would ask that council would uh, look at it as a one-year pilot project with an option of a second year, depending on what the new council decides, as we know that we're coming up to a new election year. I'll leave you with those thoughts uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ms. Franco. Uh, any questions from members of council to the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Chris, thank you for being here tonight, giving us your thoughts. Uh, that matter will come up very shortly on the agenda. Okay, uh, tax applications, members of council. Deputy Mayor Ward, I think you have a motion regarding your tax application. <clears throat> yes, I do. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the list of applications for cancellation, reduction, or additions to taxes to council dated October 25th, 2021, submitted by the Treasurer in the amount of $9,958.93 be approved. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the list of application for cancellation, reduction, or addition to taxes to council dated October 25th, 2021, submitted by the Treasurer in the amount of $9,958.93 be approved. Ms. Cook, have we had any objections to this list of application for cancellation for redu uh, reduction or additions of taxes? No, Mayor Lehman, we have not. Okay, any comments or questions from members of council? No, okay. Um, Mr. Miller, you're listed here too. Have you received any objections to this? I have not, Mayor Lehman. Okay, thank you very much. So seeing that, uh, if there are no comments from members of council, I'll take the vote. Those in favor, please indicate. Nobody is opposed. That carries unanimously. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, we do not have a communication item on tonight's agenda, which brings us to the committee reports. Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that um, Planning Committee report dated October 5th, 2021, is circulated to be received. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the Planning Committee report dated October 5th, 2021, be received. This is to receive the report from the public meeting uh, regarding 181 Burton Avenue Planning Committee on the 5th. Any comments or questions? It's to be received. Okay. Seeing none, those in favour? Or any opposed? None. Carries. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section A of the General Committee Report dated October 18th, 2021, is circulated to be adopted. Okay, we're moving to the General Committee Report from last week now. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section A of the General Committee Report dated October 18th, 2021, is circulated to be adopted. These were the consent items, and uh, it they are. Uh, the BIA financial commitments, the Brine Drive transportation improvements, Harvey Road to Kaplan, the residential rental licensing, absentee landlord pilot project and draft bylaw, uh, two parking investigations, one on Blake Street and the other on Cuthbert, and the Performing Arts Centre Task Force um, expense funding. Any comments, questions, or amendments? Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I know that uh, another member had an amendment, but uh, I'm gonna move an amendment for the uh, 21G238, that staff in legis um, legal legislation and court uh, services department prepare an intake form for the 2022 business plan for citywide proactive enforcement of yard maintenance, parking and property standards citywide. And I can speak to that. Okay, so we've got an amendment. It's moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Jim Harris, that motion 21G238 of Section A of the General Committee report dated October 18th be amended by deleting the motion in its entirety and replacing it with the following, that staff in the Legislative and Court Services Department prepare an intake form for the 2022 business plan for citywide proactive enforcement of yard maintenance, parking and property standards, uh, brackets exterior, uh, citywide. Uh, so this is the motion uh, that's an amendment to the motion on the residential rental licensing uh, pilot project and it would replace the printed motion uh, with a uh, with that amendment. Councillor Thompson, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Liam. Um, 
Just reading the uh, existing reports, and uh, and I fully appreciate the work Councillor uh, Reitman has done on this, but just knowing that by putting a license, it actually puts the city in a liability position as well, and it becomes an administrative nightmare, and it actually doesn't affect the root problem of the parking and the, the property maintenance and stuff, and I believe that if we had a proactive approach to the existing bylaws, we wouldn't be punishing the good landlords and creating um, an added cost when, uh, you know, we, we talk around the table quite a bit on the affordability of rental units. So that's uh, pretty much there, and I'm uh, open for questions. Okay, uh, on the amendment, members of council, uh, so to be clear, the amendment would remove the printed motion and instead direct staff to prepare an intake form for proactive enforcement of yard maintenance, parking property standards citywide. Councilor Reema. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, Councilor Thompson's um, efforts here. Um, I think we're all looking to do something that's going to be effective and um, up to this point, uh, we've been singularly ineffective, um, especially in the Georgian area. But I have been, been, people have been asking, could we have this across the city? Uh, much wider area, because these are issues that happen everywhere. And my view of it at this point is that um, I'm very content with the, um, with the, uh, pilot project at this point because we do have to see how it goes and we do have to roll it out and that will take a little bit of time. Um, the real issue with not licensing but going with more um, enforcement is just that. Um, we are, if we do that, we are hiring people and doing more enforcement. And the problem comes in is that enforcement is always after the fact. It's when something's already gone wrong. And now we have to have staff um, go out and try to make it right. The whole thought behind the um, licensing process is that it drives compliance. We don't have to go enforcing, uh, but people come for their license and we get a chance to uh, work with them in order to make sure that they have safe uh, and suitable housing. And the beauty of it is, is that the next year, um, if things aren't working out, we can go back to that landlord and say, you know what, um, how, can we, how can you resolve the problems that we've been having? So it gives us a chance to do some dialogue as opposed to um, sending the enforcement officer um, after them. I don't think it's going to really affect affordability um, there is such a thing as market, and uh, you can't charge more than the market if you're renting. Um, I don't think it'll drive landlords out. I think the other part of it is is that we have um, we have a lot of landlords that are really great and do a good job, and I really um, am reluctant to uh, go after them. But um, I think that at this point we have to treat people equally. I've, I've heard the comments about, um, you know, the, the fact that we're only doing part of the city, um, but we have to get our feet wet somewhere and we have to uh, roll this out. It may well be that we will eventually roll it out across the city. Um, that, that'll be for another council uh, to decide. Um, I was uh, also going to uh, earlier speak to this uh, matter because I know that Councillor Congle has a, a motion uh, that amends uh, the uh, the motion that's before us, um, and I'm going to second that. Um, and what effectively it does is it incents um, uh, uh, landlords um, if they apply within the first month um, of of the bylaw rolling out. Um, then we the proposal is that we reduce the fee by uh, fifty percent. Um, and I'm expecting that all of the landlords that 
know what they're doing and are doing a good job, um, we'll take advantage of that. That will reduce our staff uh, involvement as well. Um, but that's, that's uh, a further amendment uh, that uh, we would like to make. Uh, another part of that amendment is that we would ask our staff to come back to give us an update report um, just to see how it's going and how we might tweak uh, the proposal um, in a year or so. Because I'm sure that there will be some learning that, that we need to do. Um, we license every business in town, or a lot of businesses in town. And um, this one is no different. And this one has a dramatic impact on um, the neighborhood, uh, people's property values, um, and just the, the accommodation uh, of the tenants. There's an awful lot of, um, I don't want to say exploitation, but it is getting close to that. So um, I think there are tenants that are really being taken advantage of. And uh, I think that uh, this is a win all the way around um, as, as far as the city is concerned. So I'm going to ask you to support the original motion um, as it's printed. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Rima. Others who wish to comment? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, my first question would be to uh, Fire Chief Main Prize or one of his deputies uh, who may be on the call. Um, my question would be, how would this change your ability to be able to gain access from an inspection purpose uh, to be able to inspect the interior of these homes? Because uh, part of it through the licensing was going to give staff the ability to select those problem properties. Um, would this new direction prohibit uh, your ability to uh, do that? Or do you have special provisions under the fire code to give you uh, the access to uh, people's homes? Hello. Hi, Deputy Clark, we can see you. Oh, oh great, thank we you. We could see you. Oh, there you are, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Through the mayor to Councillor Harvey, uh, our ability to access properties is permissive uh, through our legislation. So we would still need um, uh, someone to let us in the door. So if the um, property owner is there and uh, they have uh, they can let us in that's great or if we knock on the door we still have to ask to uh to be let in unless we uh, get a warrant which is very difficult to achieve just a follow-up if i could mayor lehman um so in your opinion um would this amendment prohibit your ability or would your ability to access one's home be no different regardless of the amendment or the original motion before council. Through the mayor, if we have the uh, applications in our hands to access the property, then uh, it's a lot easier to um, make an appointment and go and see uh, what's happening inside a property. So anytime there's an, ap an application or a request to access a property, that is um, the best way for us to get in. But uh, again, it doesn't give us any special um, rights or access. Great, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, maybe at first, uh, just a question um, through you to, um, I guess, Ms. McAlpine. In the February 27, 2017 report, um, I think it's uh, page three, paragraph, paragraph 12, um, there's a reference to recent efforts have included the proactive enforcement with a zero tolerance approach to vehicles parked on front lawns, contrary to the front yard parking provisions of the zoning bylaw. Um, this enforcement has, was, has primarily been carried out in Ward 1, and this is the area where the local residents have experienced continuous concerns. Um, can you speak a little bit to 
the success of this proactive approach, which is different than our general approach to bylaw infractions and how that impacted the area during that, during that time? Thank you. Through you, uh, through Mayor Lehman to you, Councillor Jim Harris, I can advise that when we did pilot initiatives or short-term initiatives for proactive enforcement, um, I believe the residents would indicate that they felt that there was uh, an, a difference for them uh, in the neighborhood impact that the properties had. However, we, weren't we were unable to sustain the proactive enforcement as we were required to reallocate staff to complete that proactive enforcement. Um, and without additional resources being added over time, um, there, there hasn't been the opportunity to continue proactive enforcement. Yeah, your mic's not on. Uh, I, I, there we go. I put it on and off. Thank you. A follow up, uh, Mary Lehman, through you. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, geez. Some nights are easier, right? <laughs> so, follow up, please. Uh, Ms. McAlpine, the, in the reports, and we have one from 2017 uh, that compares against Oshawa Waterloo, uh, one from 2019 that compares Oshawa Waterloo Thorold. In 2021, we have Kitchener, London, Niagara Falls, Ottawa, St. Catharines, Thorold, Windsor. And maybe we should have debated this more last, last week, so for that I'll own and I'll apologize. Um, but in, in that report, over those uh, three separate reports over the last four years, has there any area been identified as having a regionalized approach to enforcement? Mary Lehman, through you to Councillor Harris. Um, there has been a focus in some of the municipalities in specific areas um, as part of their start. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't recall which one in particular, but most have been uh, community-wide to address community concerns with different parameters for how frequently uh, a residential rental is required to be licensed and different parameters for the licensing process, whether that involves inspections or merely affidavits indicating that the property is in compliance. So there's a fair amount of range within the municipalities and very little opportunity to compare apples to apples. Great, thank you. And maybe just one more follow up. I, I, in the reports that we have, and, and the reports from um, 2017 and 2019, uh, the reports were focused on reviewing um, uh, uh, bylaw enforcement as it relates to these type of licensing issues. Um, and the report, though, that was requested from staff in 2021 was not to review whether we should license or not, but to how we would how we would go forward with a with a licensing program. Is that correct? Through Mayor Lehman to Councillor Harris, the direction provided by council was very specific. Um, it was for staff to bring back a licensing bylaw with very specific parameters. Staff have attempted to meet the direction provided by council, um, and. Uh, in the form of the bylaw um, in accordance with the council direction. It's not, um, as you'll see in the alternatives, um, it isn't a review of all the options. It's specifically reporting back on what staff were specifically directed to provide. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and, and as I recall from reading the two prior reports that were asked about licensing, the value of it, it was determined that staff recommended uh, that licensing not um, be um, pursued. And I'm just noting in the summary, um, and again, I guess the issue is really trying to manage expectations. And we have identified, and Mr. Frankel talked about that, we have a concern in a primary concern in one area, but we have a more generalized concern, I believe, as it relates to absentee landlord uh, issues, which I think is what um, uh, Councillor Thompson's amendment will 
um, address, but I'll just say that um, in the summary of paragraph 34 of the most recent report, um, there's a, as it says, however, as previously discussed, it is not believed to address the underlying issues beyond that of the current enforcement measures already in place. So that's that the, the it is with reference to the, li to the licensing. So, you know, with, with what we've seen and what we've read and what we understand from the three reports that are in front of us, I think in um, the and review, I think the approach that um, Councillor Thompson has provided with his amendment um, actually gets to the, addresses the root issues that we're trying to get to, to really have our um, neighborhoods uh, more enjoyable and not be negatively impacted by rentals. We, we d definitely understand renting is a very important part of our housing um, uh, uh, options, but um, when it becomes a concern for, for the neighbors, obviously that's when we have to step in and create policies, and I think the, the approach Councillor Thompson is providing is a, is a solid recommendation, so I'll support that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Kungle. Uh, thank you, Worship. Three to staff. Um, are we already planning or have we actioned already to bring back a two FTE enforcement officer intake form for the 2022 budget consideration? Hello. <laughs> Mary Lehman, through you to Councillor Kungle. The 2020 Enforcement Services Review recommended additional staffing. As Council may recall, um, uh, staff in the municipal law enforcement area had not been increased in 17 years. Um, uh, the review recommended as a very minor minimum two additional full-time um, for 2022. Um, and that was not moving towards proactive enforcement. That was merely trying to catch up from 17 years of not hiring additional staff. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I t completely appreciate and would love to see us move into a proactive capacity approach. At this point in time, based on considerations we've had in public engagement, I, I can say as a Ward 3 counselor, I do have residents keen to see the outcomes of the pilot and potential expansion and that there is an interest to get towards a citywide or a broader city approach with proactive enforcement. Um, I'd like to still look at the consideration of this pilot based on the conversations we've had to date and hopefully bring forth an amendment where we could look at this before three years and take some learnings in year one uh, and then have a bit more of an informed conversation about do we need or do we feel the need to have a, a license or a multi-year license? What does this look like? How successful could we be? And I see it as a, a proactive enforcement approach that gets into the inside of a home that really looks at those conditions around safety uh, and, and other concerns versus um, some of the, the differences I hear sometimes about the need for proactive and the desire for proactive enforcements on property standards around the exterior of a home um, which I know that we're not at the capacity we're desiring um, from a resident feedback, um, but I would, I would like to see this continue in some way from a, a pilot for a minimum of a year. So I, I will kindly um, not support the amendment, but I, I do hope we get to that phase of proactive enforcement. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, and maybe this question goes towards the mover, the mover of the amendment, uh, Councillor Thompson. I think what you said in your uh, in your amendment that you're uh, trying to make the city um, safer, have less red tape for residents, um, become more efficient, <clears throat> and save the city money, right? Uh, and that I can get behind. But I just want to maybe be clear here. Uh, maybe you could read it again, or I can maybe ask you a question. The, in the initial uh, motion, you have six new employees. And in your uh, amendment, there's how many? It's an intake for four bylaw enforcement. Four officers. bylaw enforcements. And you're still keeping the three-year pilot project? No, my amendment actually deletes the motion. Right. And just the amendment. Just Do you mind if you read it again from them, please? I, I, or Mayor, Mayor Lehman has it, sorry. Yeah. So. Um, the motion deletes the existing uh, motion in its entirety. So no, Ward 1, no licensing. 
uh, what would happen instead is that staff in the Legislative and Court Services uh, Department prepare an intake form for the 2022 business plan for citywide proactive enforcement of yard maintenance, parking and property standards uh, citywide. Um, to be clear though, uh, the number of staff is not being specified in the motion. Councillor Thompson, that's your, based on your conversation with city staff, that's what they'd bring back? I'm sorry. I, I don't quite. see the four staff in the motion itself. So is the, the number of hiring four, did you say the, the oh, motion? Uh, fact sorry, yeah, I thought it was four bylaw officers. Okay, yeah. so you, in preparing this amendment, you spoke with staff, they said they would bring back a form that would require yeah. Four more bylaw enforcement. Okay, there you Sorry. go. Sorry. Back to you, Councilman Kent. Okay, thank you, Mayor Levin. Okay, I'll be supporting. Okay, uh, Councillor Natalie Harris, I have you next. Thank you, Mayor Levin. Um, through you to Miss Peters, if she's on the line. Um, oh, where? Oh, hi. <laughs> it's been so long. I know we totally have to get used to that. Oh my gosh. Hi, I'm like, waiting for you to like turn your screen on. Hello, nice to see you in person. My question is, um, the city stopped the area-specific ban of second suites in Georgian College boundary because of legal concerns. Am I correct? I'm trying to refresh my memory. We did have concerns about area. And, and sorry, through you, in which way? Can you elaborate just to refresh my memory? I'm I sorry? I guess I'll, I'll ask one more question. So specifically, is the original motion uh, a contravention of the law? Was that something that was a legal concern that we were, um, it was stopped because we were possibly crossing the line legally? In respect of this bylaw, uh, we did not examine that issue. Okay, sorry, through you, Mary Lehman. I guess I'm not, I'm not Maybe I'm not saying it properly. Wasn't there not a stoppage of the second suites in, uh, we stopped the area specific ban on the second suites in the Georgian College because it was a concern that we were focusing just on that area? Yes, there was a concern with respect to the second suite bylaw. And we reviewed the specific bylaw and found a concern. Correct, so uh, in your opinion, legally this original motion doesn't uh, go against the law in any way. I think if I can, I think the uh, question is, do you have the same concerns about a licensing bylaw that is specific for one area of the city? Thank you. Without having looked at it, we would have to look at the wording of the bylaw. Uh, there is a concern with respect to uh, specifically limiting. Uh, if the logic for the limiting is that it is a pilot only. Uh, sometimes that <clears throat> provides a logic uh, for a limited um, beginning to a bylaw that is then reviewed. So without seeing how the bylaw is drafted, and it hasn't been drafted yet, um, uh, couldn't say for certain, but a pilot, uh, there does, uh, there is probably more um, uh, rationale for an initial limited approach. A follow-up, Mayor Lehman. Uh, so, let me, I just want to make sure I confirm all the procedure properly. So, if this passes, the bylaws developed, and then does it come back to committee and we can say yay or nay again? With your opinion, your legal opinion, on whether or not that would be a concern to you? It comes back, yes. Through Mayor Lehman to uh, Councillor Harris. Um, the intent of the report right now would be that the bylaw is dependent on the approval of the staff at budget time. If the staff, um, if the approval for the six staff that are originally in the staff report um, at the ask for the staff is not approved at budget time, we do not have the resources to uh, move forward with the program, so it would be moot. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I guess the reason why I'm digging a little bit more on the legal concern, and I'm just trying to grasp it all, is um, 
this still wasn't a real firm, this is a good idea, <laughs> legally, from our l lawyer. So um, I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna still listen to other people around. I, again, I appreciate everyone's um, comments because it's helping me as well, but thank you. I think Ms. McAlpine has uh, something to add. Mary Leeman, through you to Councillor Natalie Harris, you raised some good points, and I thought I would just remind members of Council that the specific direction provided to staff was to undertake this as a pilot specific to this area. Staff were directed to come back with a bylaw that was specific to this area. It wasn't uh, whether or not staff would recommend that approach. Yeah, th thank you, that's fair. I just, I wanted even further clarification on the legal parts of it in this today. So thank you. That's an interesting answer. I can remember a COVID recovery measure though that was deemed to have legal concerns and uh, was actioned despite um, direction from council. So I, I would like to see actually some of those legal concerns uh, 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 addressed certainly before this comes forward if we are going to continue on the path of a area specific piece. Um, and I, I just further to that uh, question, I'd like to follow up Councillor Natalie Harris's question, because I think it's an excellent one. Um, is, is there a difference because this is a licensing bylaw versus previously uh, was a planning matter that limited a particular use? Uh, Ms. Peters, does that change the legal, I, I don't know, consideration around whether or not it, the municipality has the ability to do something area specific? I'm hesitant to give um, uh, just an off the top of my head opinion on it. The fundamental concerns uh, remain um, with respect to the um, variegated application. Um, if there is a rationale and a logic that maintains it within the uh, municipality's authority, health and safety or any other, um, uh, municipal authority to proceed, um, it, 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 may, it, it may differ. Okay, so certainly some clarity is required here, but thanks for raising it, Councillor Harris. Uh, the floor is still yours. Uh, no, that's good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think most members have commented, but not all. Are there other comments on the amendment? Councillor Aylwin? Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, this is an issue that I've kind of gone back and forth on, not really sure what the right approach is, and I think all of the council, we've, we've struggled with that. Um, but I think uh, something that Councillor Jim Harris said, he really got to the, the heart of the issue here, pointing out in the staff report, uh, paragraph 34, that the issue is that there are property standards issues that need to be addressed. That's the bottom line, and how do we best address them? Um, I like the approach that uh, Councillor Thompson has put forward because it's a direct approach, more inf more proactive enforcement, um, and you're addressing those issues immediately or as immediately as possible after the budget is approved. Um, with the licensing bylaw, you're still going to require that extra level of enforcement, even with the licensing regime in place. Um, so we would still have to hire those additional officers. Um, but then on top of that, you're putting a licensing program, which um, I, I do have some concerns about um, the, the high fee. Um, I worry about what that means um, for tenants. And uh, we know that there are people who own their homes who don't take care of their properties as well. It's not just rental properties that have these issues. So I think by taking a citywide approach, not limiting it to one area of the city, not limiting it to just looking at uh, rental units, um, I think it's a, a more fair approach and it actually gets to the heart of the issue that residents uh, want action on um, and that's addressing these property standards to the best of our ability. So um, I will support the, the amendment from Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Thanks Councillor Owen. Uh, anyone else wishes to comment? Okay, I just had a couple of questions uh, of staff. Um, so. Ms. McAlpine indicated, uh, you indicated that there was a, um, an impact when we went to proactive enforcement, however briefly, in terms of uh, the parking problems um, on front lawns and that sort of thing. Um, do you recall or, well, I guess do you recall the degree to which our costs for that proactive 
pilot were recovered through fines that were issued to people who offended? Mayor Lehman, I don't recall the specifics of the fine recovery, but in general, fines um, specifically for parking don't necessarily recover your costs. We do have the alternative within the licensing, or sorry, within the yard maintenance and the property standards bylaw to, um, to uh, charge an administrative fee when we are required to go in and undertake cleanup that covers the city's cost to do that work, um, but it's not necessarily a fine-based approach. Okay, um, if there was, uh, uh, sorry, then maybe could you just summarize um, the degree to which cost recovery is possible for, if this amendment was uh, passed, so uh, it specifies uh, yard maintenance, parking, and property standards. You just spoke to parking, I think. Uh, yard maintenance and property standards, what, what is, it's, it's only if we do the work that we recover any of our costs? Can you just speak to that a bit? Mary Lehman, thank you for the question. Um, it depends on where we're at in the process. There are recoveries for uh, inspections if there hasn't been compliance. And Ms. Banting's on the line if you wish to walk through the specifics of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you why I'm asking the question. I think one of the uh, concerns for me uh, over the last week as we considered the proposed licensing is, is the relatively high staff cost and, you know, staff of recommended a fee that covers most of the, the, the cost. Um, but that fee, I tend to agree with the opinion that it is so high, it is going to both affect affordability and become a barrier for some landlords. Um, you know, I, I think for many it, it, it would not. But anything that adds to the affordability challenges right now is a problem. So uh, notwithstanding um, the, uh, I guess what I'd like to know from Ms. Banting is if we took this approach instead, are we only charging offenders, if you will, um, and if we are, um, what degree of cost recovery do we typically accomplish with yard maintenance and property standards? Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, to all members of council in the response, we have the ability currently uh, through our fees bylaw to charge service fees for those uh, persons found in violation. It's a tiered approach already. Um, so we do have first offense for exterior uh, matters that we come across, uh, second offense and so on. Uh, we also have it for interior matters that we come across. That being said, um, our city approach to enforcement is generally if we've never been to a location in the past, so there's no previous complaints within the um, preceding 12 months, that is a uh, one-time attendance free, if you want to call it. So there's no fee charged for the first time the officer goes, providing those people are now um, bringing their property into compliance. If there's no compliance found, then service fees are charged and uh, it can go up to and including as Ms. McAlpine stated, we go in and complete the work and those fees again are charged back to the owner of the property. So in all measures, uh, ultimately the owner of the property is responsible for it. The difference uh, with the amendment that's proposed would be increased staffing to actually be able to do proactive enforcement um, where we are literally driving down the streets and, and noticing it prior to complaints coming in. Currently, that is not an option. Um, as you would have heard in our service review that we provided last fall uh, and Ms. McAlpine we don't have the resources to literally drive down the street. It, it is currently solely reactive enforcement um, where we respond to complaints received. So it is an after the fact currently. Okay, that's very helpful, Ms. Manting, thank you. Um, and could you just comment as well, this was my other question in, in summary, because I think we've, we've kind of been talking a bit around this piece. If, if you go to a, if we, if we remain with the current bylaws, which are um, property maintenance uh, or property standards, yard maintenance, parking, uh, and we don't go to a licensing regime. What powers of 
inspection and enforcement do you lose? What, what ability do you, do, you, do you not get <laughs> if we shift and we don't do a licensing approach? I guess the positive way to say that would be if we stuck with the proposed approach, the licensing, what additional enforcement would you be able to conduct? Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, there wouldn't be, from an, our enforcement perspective, there isn't necessarily an additional enforcement that we gain through licensing. We would gain um, a heating certificate to show that their systems have been inspected. Uh, we would gain the electrical inspection. We would gain proof of liability insurance. So those, those matters that are generally addressed through a licensing process. From an enforcement perspective, um, as Deputy Clark indicated, we cannot enter the home without being invited in, um, either by a tenant or the owner themselves, even under a licensing regime. As, as it being a requirement to be a, light, to be a licensed operator, that doesn't mean they have to let us in. Um, it means that we may have to go forward with legal action if they choose not to let us in uh, to complete the inspections and or obtain a warrant, uh, as Deputy Clark had indicated, which frankly is, is almost next to impossible to get unless we can prove there's a violation that we need to go in and address. I see. Okay. Um, then I guess the comment I would make on the amendment um, I actually went back and forth on it as I listened to this discussion, so I'm glad we're having this discussion around the table. Um, but uh, I am going to support it. I, I think that th there were a couple of pieces um, on further sort of reflection over the course of this week that did cause me concern. One is the sort of fairness of charging a $1,000 fee to all the good landlords, to be frank. Um, the second is the fact that any cost increases will get passed on to tenants. And actually, Mr. Franco made a point that a number of others had made to me in, in correspondence from the community, which is, it ain't just your $1,000 fee, city. It's the other stuff we'll have to do to, to meet the requirements of the license. Uh, there were varying diff various different opinions uh, on that. Um, I, I think what I, what I hesitate uh, with, and I, you know, I, Councilor Reitman has been at this one on behalf of his residents for three years, and um, I, I can imagine some frustration uh, for those who are, are expecting a licensing regime that will allow a few more measures than uh, currently exist. Uh, and also, I think, uh, get serious. And I think Councillor Reitma is right. We, we have never got serious around enforcing the laws that are on the books um, uh, in terms of really dedicating the resources to it that are required to, to address the concerns that, that are particularly serious in, in Ward 1, uh, but as Councillor Thompson and others have mentioned, they, they do exist citywide. So, um, you know, if, if the question that was in front of us tonight was, um, do you need additional, do we need to be giving staff additional legal tools to enforce a safety matter, uh, get compliance because our current legal regime cannot give us compliance? You know, it's not cut and dried because there are a few things that you need a licensing bylaw to do. We just heard them from Ms. Ms. Banting. But there's only a few. And I'm not compelled that there's going to be a significant improvement in our ability to ensure the safety of rentals. Um, I will say that um, we've been, we have had a number of occasions. We talked to, Jim Harris uh, rightly talked about the 2017 pilot. We've talked about this issue for some time, and boy, Council, we've got to be serious about this. So here's the watch what you wish for. <laughs> because this one will come with a price tag that might be higher. Let's have no illusions about this. So there's four bylaw staff. That's less than the six, I think, that were in the staff report for the licensing approach. If we take the bylaw approach and approve this amendment, yes, it's four staff, not six. That's a lower number. But I'm going to guess the cost recovery is not going to be 87%. So be aware that choosing this path may not save us any money, may not save the taxpayer. In fact, it's almost guaranteed to cost the taxpayer more because more of the funding for this approach would have to come out of general revenue. I don't know that for sure. I'm not sure staff know that for sure based on the answer to my question, but I'm pretty sure they'll come up with it because they got to put it on the intake form. <laughs> so 
uh, I guess my caution is, and that was my second caution around this approach, is, is I don't think it's going to come back any less expensive. And in fact, I think it may put a higher, relatively higher cost on the general tax base. But the difference there is probably in the order of a few hundred thousand dollars at the most. Um, and so in the global scheme of things, that's why we have a budget that lays out all of our issues and all our priorities and, and gives us the proper basis to say we are going to spend 200000 more on this because it's a priority or we aren't. And I'm, I'm very pleased, by the way, that both staff, Councillor Reitma and his approach to this, and now Councillor Thompson tonight, have said, you know what, do this properly through the budget process in a month, which is when the budget lands, uh, rather than trying to allocate the money now in advance of the budget. So I'm, I'm going to support this, not without a few reservations, uh, to be honest, and not least of which is that uh, I've, I've always tried to help ward councillors with ward issues. And I'm, uh, the ward one councillor spoke very eloquently in favour of the reasons why we need to get real in our uh, enforcement and our actions in, in his area of the city. And I definitely share that. So if the amendment passes, I will be looking for us to support it again at budget time, and that's going to come at a cost. So I'll just eyes wide open, and we'll see you in four weeks <laughs> when it comes to the cost of it. But I'll support the amendment for now. And I will call the question on it. Recorded vote. Recorded vote's been requested. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm starting with Councillor Reitma. No. Councillor Aylwin. Yes. Councillor Kungle. Yes. Deputy Mayor Ward. Yes. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. Councillor Harvey. Yes. Councillor Jim Harris. Yes. Councillor Morales. Yes. Councillor McCann. Yes. Mayor Lehman. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you for the discussion, for the thoughtful comments and discussion, all members. Um, and uh, we are back on Section A now as amended. Are there further comments or questions on Section A of the General Committee report? Councillor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, speaking to Section A specifically as amended, um, I'll just say I'm very supportive of this. And again, Councillor Thompson, thank you for this. Um, while this may be costing the general Barry taxpayer more money in the long run, it actually puts uh, some resources behind what they've been uh, demanding for over a decade. It efficiently addresses the concerns. One of the things I like about Section A, Mayor Lehman, as amended, is that it doesn't concentrate or earmark $750,000, give or take, to one specific area of the city uh, unequitably. It equitably uh, gives the entire city more resources, more proactive enforcement in an equitable form and distributing both the cost of that and the rewards of having uh, better enforcement throughout the city. So I, I, I really like the, uh, the pilot for that, uh, excuse me, your amendment for that reason. The reason it's also uh, positive in my light is it didn't put me in a situation of whether to consider voting for a pilot that is um, potentially illegal um, in different legal ramifications, including human rights. And I know I was on the council uh, that voted in favor of um, doing that uh, that ban of second suites within the Georgian College perimeter. So it, it, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that your amendment, uh, you know, moves away from that situation. So I'll be in f voting in favor of Section A as amended, um, including the reasons that the enforcement um, is more equitably distributed throughout the city, Mayor Lehman. Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Worship. Um, while the good conversation just occurred, I did have an amendment uh, to the original motion. Uh, out of courtesy to, uh, to Councillor Ritma, I would like to still table it, although I'm pretty sure of the outcome. <laughs> but in case it does provide good insight into what an alternate consideration would have been, Councillor Ritma an opportunity to speak to it, uh, it would have been um, adding to the original motion. Do you want me to proceed or are we past that point? I hate to tell you, we've passed that point, Councillor yeah. Kungle. If okay. you wanted to speak to your, your reasons Could for I the speak? amendment as Thank they you. relate to the enforcement, um, some brief comment would be in order. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that opportunity. So I'll share that depending on what comes at budget, I do hope this is supported. I think we've got better information clarity um, that also um, you would have seen I was in favor of. Um, 
should it change over time and we come back to this conversation, um, the proposed amendment would have at least considered in fairness to um, good performing landlords that we didn't take a blanket approach to um, fees related to licensing and that we would consider 50% of only year one um, being um, reimbursed to those that could submit a complete application within 30 days as an incentive to kind of get involved. So we do have a bit of a registry or a bit of a uh, improved communication with landlords. The other component I think that did um, maybe reflect conversations from Mr. Franco as well as others that have been in correspondence with members of council was that we really did get a status report back after a year that we didn't wait for the th three year report back so we could then have more information to consider do we proceed uh, in the original scope or not. So that's there in case we revisit this conversation or if a pilot comes up uh, in future consideration. Um, so I'll leave it there for information and then uh, we'll see where we go at budget time. Okay, thanks Councillor Kungel. On uh, section A, as amended, any further comment? Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. <clears throat> Through you, um, just a comment on the amended motion. Um, it, it, something you said about, you know, trying to help a ward councillor deal with an issue that's been an ongoing issue for probably six or seven years. Um, my amendment doesn't take away the great work that Councillor Reitman has done, which started the conversation and I actually second the motion to, to get it to staff and worked with Councillor Reitman. Um, he, he did his job and he got it to staff and we received reports and sometimes the supporting document wasn't there and I, I didn't believe that at budget time we would be able to support it based on the staff reports. But I just wanted to make a comment that he did absolutely great work, got the conversation going and, uh, you know, and to Councillor Morales's point, a, a more equitable across the city where every councillor around here has these issues, which this might be a couple hundred thousand, a hundred percent, but it'll be spread out and then possibly with recovery by enforcement. And, you know, we're in a position where a great street, a great neighborhood sometimes comes with a cost, but our main goal is not to recover money. It's to get people comply and, you know, enjoy our neighborhoods. So I just didn't want to leave that without saying that, you know, as much as, you know, Councilor Reeman may feel that, you know, this was not the way he wanted, but it, it was his good work that got us to this. So, thank you. Thanks, Councilor Thompson. Councilor Reeman. Yes, and I should just respond to that a minute. And I very much appreciate um, the work that and the support that I feel all the way around the table. Um, and I, I do feel that even though I, um, I was a single vote, um, I, I do feel that everyone understands the situation and um, is prepared to put the shoulder to the wheel. So I, I very much appreciate that. Um, and I, I guess I'm old enough to know that there isn't one solution to a problem. There may be more than one solution to the problem and I may not have the only solution or the best one. Um, this problem, in Ward 1 has existed for many years and it's gotten worse over time. And so we all agree, I think, that what we've been doing in the past has not worked. And continuing to do it just makes things worse and doesn't help, it doesn't get us and that is to build great neighborhoods. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, we're gonna have this discussion in four weeks it's, it's going to cost us money. Um, but I do think that um, moving to um, proactive enforcement is one of the solutions. And I'm, I'm content with that as long as we do it. Um, that's the problem, right? Um, we have lots of bylaws on the book that we never enforce. And um, that's where the disappointment and uh, comes from. And the other part of it is, is that we are trying to build a great city here. Um, and Barrie is a great, great place. We just need to um, work on some of these problems that exist. And I would be happy to go for a walk with any one of us around this table on some of these streets and you'll know what we're talking about. So, and I'd like to thank you for your support and um, I'm very grateful uh, to get um, more 
proactive enforcement because I think that's one of the tools that we would definitely need. So thanks. You're here. Thanks, Councillor Reba. Any further comment? Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you for your gracious response, um, Councillor Reba. We do understand that we can hopefully do better with regard to this and not just in, in the area around the college but throughout the, the, uh, the city. It just made me um, think back as we looked through these reports. Um, in the original uh, motion that kind of uh, put this in action, there was also a, a request to, to meet with the college um, regarding uh, housing. And I'm just wondering that particular part of that uh, motion. I'm wondering if um, I know, I know your, yourself and uh, uh, Mayor Lehman and uh, Council Morales attended, was there anything of note given the college? And I, and I know this has been talked about being a, a many, um, many year kind of problem and wondering if the conversation about housing and the college's um, ability to impact that positively came up and, how, and what the results were. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. I'll, I can um, start the reply and, uh, and the, uh, the other members who are there can add to it if they wish. Um, I think there's, there's long been a recognition from the college of, of some of the frustrations around uh, the, the small number of student-occupied homes that are a problem, uh, but that, that they are quite the problem in, uh, in, that, uh, in those areas. Um, the uh, specific purpose or, or discussion of the meeting was to be around uh, the college's role itself in providing housing. And I think the short answer, you may want to ask later tonight as uh, we have the uh, college president uh, and the chair of the board giving a presentation shortly. But if I can summarize correctly, I think to be fair to them, uh, they were in the midst of a 40 or 30 percent, I've forgotten, uh, a drop due to COVID and the anticipated number of students in person uh, in the next year or two was not known at that time. Um, uh, you know, an update on that might, might be timely. Um, but I think the, the, uh, uh, the, the basic message at that point was um, as we go forward and grow, that's a conversation to have. But uh, at the time, uh, there was not a lot of uh, belief that that was something they could be doing in 2021 or 2022, uh, given the, uh, the student numbers and the fiscal situation that the college was facing. I don't know. Uh, Councillor Reitman? Yes, I think you've... Uh summarize it quite well. Um, I think that uh, my experience over these last three years, um, and this is particularly through the Town and Gown um, Committee, is that uh, a Georgian college is, and, and the city, I think we have a much better working relationship. And that's not to say that we had a bad one originally, but I think, I think there is a much greater um, understanding from the college um, about what uh, that that their responsibility for their students doesn't end at their gate. Um, I think there is a growing sense that uh, these students are um, are part of their responsibility. Um, I, I I think given the financial circumstances um, at the moment um, and in for the foreseeable future, I I do not expect uh, Georgian College to uh, to have the funds to um, go ahead with the further construction for uh, students on ha on campus um, I would I think that's definitely one of the solutions uh, but I um, but at this point I just don't think that it's uh, in the cards financially for them great thank you and I just want to just to be clear I, and I certainly don't want to uh, have any attention that we thought that, that we see students as a problem. I just wanted to, to highlight that item G, which just uh, was to ask about exploring the construction and operation of purpose-built student housing on Georgian College land. So just to see where they're at as far as providing housing. So, and as a person who's been a student <laughs> and housed in a densely populated Waterloo Laurier area, I understand what it's like to be a good student uh, t tenant. And uh, I'm sure we have lots of good student tenants in the Georgian College area, so thank you. Okay, on section A as amended, any further comment? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. Those in favor of section A and opposed? Sorry, Councilor Morales, missed your vote. In favor? In favor, okay. Uh, so that's unanimous in favor of section A as amended, I believe. 
Okay, Deputy Mayor Ward, Section B. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the General Committee Report dated April 18th, 2021, is circulated to be received. Moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Section B of the General Committee Report dated October 18th, 2021 has circulated be received. This is to receive the presentation by CAM regarding the water asset management plans. Just to receive the presentation. Comments, questions? Seeing none, those in favor of Section B? Anybody opposed? None? That carries. Section C, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson. That Section C of the General Committee Report dated April 18th, 2021 has circulated be adopted. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section C of the General Committee report dated October 18th, 2021, as circulated, be adopted. This is to approve the Water Asset Management Plan. Comments or questions? Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lima. Through you, I do have an amendment I'd like to put on the floor. Okay. Uh, so it's um, put forward by myself, seconded by Councillor Morales, um, that to add the paragraph that staff from the infrastructure corporate asset management departments develop or acquire a comprehensive modeling system that will enable determination of proposed performance for each year of the 10 year planning period of the water asset management plan and report back to general committee. And I can speak to that. Okay, I have an amendment. Moved by Councillor Natalie Harris, seconded by Councillor Morales, to add a paragraph uh, to Motion 21G243 uh, that staff from the infrastructure and corporate asset management departments uh, acquire, develop or acquire a comprehensive modeling system that will enable determination of proposed performance for each year of the 10 year planning period of the water asset management plan and report back to general committee. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. And let me just pull up the right page of this plan. There's so many pages. If you just give me one second. So if for anybody's reference, I'm going to look at page 55 of the actual plan, which is... <coughs> which is page 68 of the presentation. Uh, so just quickly reviewing some of the major concerns that definitely came to mine and Councillor Morales's attention was uh, according to 6.23 with renewal financial sustainability um, there's a lot of concerns about sustaining the assets and how large the gap is so it shows the cost of forecast needed renewal activities over the next 10 years as 9.4 million per year and the budgeted annual funding projected to be available to undertake the forecast needed life cycle activities over the next 10 years 7.2 million per year so there's a funding gap of 2.2 million per year so 22 million over the next 10 years um, and then as if you go to page, da, 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 so page 61 or table 7-1, um, I spoke with Ms. Oakley about this briefly and, and I think, uh, and Councillor Morales and I had a more a further discussion about it. So in the third column, other opportunities, it says acquire, uh, it's, it's an opportunity that they can acquire a comprehensive modeling system that will enable determination of proposed performance for each year of the 10 year planning period. And while I do completely understand the answer to the question, and um, CAO Prowse also gave me some feedback as well, that we need the data, obviously, to be able to um, put forward this type of modeling system. Um, but I also think it's very, very timely to make sure that this is something we're starting to and or, or develop now. This is such a huge gap. Um, and years to come this is i'm probably not going to be sitting at this table but um, i would like to be able to sit back and know that we had a very comprehensive plan with respect to the data that we do collect i know that miss oakley said she wasn't 100 percent sure what that would look like um, but maybe we can lead the way if this isn't something that another city does yet like hey let's develop it i know that's money but look at the money look at the gap that's going to be there if we don't 
address this right now when we can. Maybe it'll take a couple years to develop it. I didn't say there would be a time frame, but I really think like we need to lead the way. We can't just say, okay, we're okay with this um, and hope that we'll figure it out in 10 years. This is a massive gap that we need to address the data that's coming in now and the data before and make sure that we have the proper modeling system in front of us now. I don't know if Councillor Morales wants to add anything to that. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Morales, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I'll, I'll be supporting it um, in addition to moving it. It's for, for the following reason. You know, the, some people say if you want to improve something, measure it. Um, and the reality is we don't really know the impact of what certain types of growth, dense, not dense, commercial, industrial, residential have on this uh, gap that we have in our, in, in our, in our uh, water and waste management system. And that's problematic. I don't want that future council that you speak of, Natalie, to say they had the opportunity to get a modeling system that better got that data so we could close the gap or at the very least slow the increasing of the gap. Uh, and they chose not to get that. That's why my question last week was, should we not have that data before we approve an official plan that determines the types of growth we're gonna have. And I get it that we need to move forward with this, and those are two independent um, uh, processes, um, but this is something very prudent um, for us to get. I think for people watching at home, the, the best analogy, because I love analogies, I'm not necessarily good at them, that I can come up with, <laughs> is when you buy a car, you know the miles per gallon. You may not be buying the car for that reason, but it, it's just reasonable that you are aware. Um, it, us not getting this would be like someone who commutes to the GTA for their work, um, just hopping into a truck and then after purchasing and not being able to give it back, realizing that it's a truck and that it's costing them double or triple what it is. They, they might have made different decisions if they had known different information. That's what this motion is trying to do. It's trying to get that information. It's not going to be easy, uh, but it's necessary uh, to for a fiscally responsible and sustainable city. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Uh, Councilor Reitma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a question of staff. Um, do we have any sense of um, what the cost of, of getting this kind of uh, modeling uh, done, put together, um, and how effective it is? Is Ms. Oakley on the call? Do we know? She is? Okay. If we can just bring her in to answer that question. Okay. Hi, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Oakley. Uh, through you to Councillor Reepma, um, I, I don't, I'm not able to provide you with the cost, but certainly um, if this motion is successful, then staff can do some investigation into the types of systems that are available um, and, um, and work with our technology team and others throughout the city to, uh, to sort of try to just scope something out and perhaps even come back to Council with, with options for what sort of type of implementation uh, we could be looking at. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, other comments on the proposed amendment? Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Worship. Through you to Ms. Oakley. Um, while I completely value modeling systems, could you speak to the current state of data that we have? Do we have data at hand that is reliable, that's been validated, that we would then leverage a modeling system with or are we a year or two out from having a, a database of information we would be applying into a modeling system? Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Kungle. Uh, there are always opportunities to improve our data. Uh, we have uh, some really great data and our staff in the field and elsewhere are collecting more great data all of the time. Um, so I would, I would say that um, where we don't have data, we can make assumptions um, uh, to certainly fill in gaps. Um, and, uh, and while I would love to have better data, um, you know, certainly we, again, I would say that we, if you, if this amendment is, is successful, then staff would go away, um, and, and perhaps propose something that would be reasonable, including perhaps the data collection exercise as part of the implementation. Uh, thank you. I like that ap approach to also appreciating the, the data integrity and, and collection process, as well as the tool that we would be, be leveraging. And I guess the, um, maybe a friendly to Councillor Harris, because I'm not sure if I caught the full language of the amendment. Uh, would it be to investigate? So I'm not opposed to staff coming back and saying, 
these, this is what the option is, this is when we would likely apply it, um, versus acquire, and would like to understand a bit more of the information. Yeah, so j I, I was actually gonna raise the issue that the, m the motion is worded just direct staff to either develop or acquire it, but it does say report back to general committee at the end. Mm -hmm. So I was a little confused, was the intent of the motion that staff look into it, come back to us with the report before they develop or acquire it? Yes, Correct. okay. Correct, um, yeah. I mean, so I, I think it's, maybe that was just the intended wording was? Um, the, the wording that you have through you is correct. So I, um, we're hoping, to, as far as I'm aware, our conversation, you, they would bring something that would work back. Um, but there's no d timeline, there's no deadline. We're completely understanding that this is something that we're bringing forward that might have just been an opportunity. We know that they're going to inquire, um, but we want more concrete answers as to what is out there, what is the cost, like that is going to come forward to us anyways, but we want it to happen. So, um, and I completely, like I said, we were, I briefly spoke to CAO Prowse, I understand that, you know, our data is ongoing and we need data to make this. Uh, so this might take a couple years, but if we have it on the table now, maybe lead the way, like I said, with other cities and make this um, possible now, I think it's important. So the wording is correct. Sorry, so, Councillor. So the wording you, you provided. Okay, so are you imagining then that the, uh, or expecting that the staff would be acquiring it and then reporting back after they acquire it? Because that's how it reads. Is that correct, uh, Councillor Morales? Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, through you, just to clarify, um, they, can come, they can come back from the market and say these are the options, these are the prices, they would still need approval from Council. Uh, so, um, yeah, the language is that uh, the friendly in Councillor Kungle's, uh, sorry, the, the intent of Councillor Kungle's friendly is implied in the language um, because we still need final sign off because again, this could be a $200,000 cost one off, this could be a $2 million every year cost. So we still need reasonable um, approval. Yeah, okay, it's just as the, as the wording says, right now you're directing them to develop or acquire. No, no check back before Just putting that. a report back. So, Councillor Kongo, we, we, if, if it's okay with sure. you, Councillor Ayers, we yeah. can accept if your... That moves your if, your, if your intention was to ask staff to come back before they develop or acquire, like, figure it out how you're going to do it, give sure. us your best recommendation on how to do it, and then Council gets the... Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know which wording you might want. Unfortunately, we're at Council, so there's no friendlies and you've got to write everything out. Um, but if I wondered if it actually was just a word missed, because normally we would say, investigate developing or, acqu or acquiring Perfect. and report back. Perfect. Is that acceptable to the movers? Correct. Madam Clerk, we can do it whatever way you think is best. Um, uh, so it will require it to be rewritten though, yeah? Rather than just my crossing it out and adding the word? We can't do that, I guess. Mm. Yeah, all right. Oh, okay. Like the marked up one. Sure, let's do that. Go ahead, Councillor Harris. Okay, through you, Mayor Lehman, I'd like to uh, withdraw that one and then uh, reintroduce this motion, uh, which says that staff investigate the development or, or to acquire, um, sorry, that staff in infrastructure and corporate asset management um, investigate the development or acquisition of a comprehensive, comprehensive modeling system that will enable determination of proposed performance for each year of the 10-year planning period of the water asset management plan and report back to general committee. All right, there we go. It avoided an amendment. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, I think everybody is clear what's on the floor now. Uh, are there any, oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Ward, you had indicated earlier, go ahead. I actually had the very same concern, so it's been addressed. Okay, anyone else have a comment? Councillor McCain. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm just a little fuzzy on, on why there isn't a, uh, a date or a time. Councillor Harris? To be honest, I, I, I'm, I'm good with, again, maybe adjusting her, <laughs> but according to Ms. Oakley, that was just something that really wasn't readily available as an answer, so we didn't really put the deadline there because it was such a large project to put forward. I'm open to a suggestion from Ms. Oakley maybe on how much time would it take to bring that forward, that's great. Um, Ms. Oakley, if you're here, that would be wonderful. But I just, un I kind of got the sense when we talked last week that this wasn't even something that had been looked into, so it would be 
from the ground up. Am I right, Ms. Oakley? Ms. Oakley. Through you, Mary Lee Min, to Councillor Harris, uh, this is certainly something that, that uh, we have thought about and we would love to implement. Some of my staff, actually, this is their dream that they have a tool like this. Um, it hasn't actually been on the, um, on the work plan because we're working on the, again, this foundational work, um, you know, long-term asset management is a journey um, and establishing all of the work we've been doing this year and sharing with you in terms of the asset management plans. Um, you know, is, is, are those first steps. Um, I think it would be reasonable to report back um, in 18 months if that's, uh, you know, acceptable to you. Um, that would give us time to do the investigation, get a bit of a better handle on, on our data. And, and we also have some other asset management plans that we're still working on. And we could perhaps do some of that investigation through. Through you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, that it's okay. Uh, that sounds great. I was thinking it was probably going to take two years, like minimum. So 18 months sounds, if that's okay with you, Councillor McCann. <laughs> uh, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mary Lee Mint. Yeah, um, I guess I'm just trying to get my head around um, maybe Miss Oakley's direction. I'm happy to hear that she is in favor of this. It sounds like you're almost enthusiastically in favor of this. But the 18 months, can you just maybe give me a little more insight? Um, why you need 18 months? Like, what data do you need? Like, why not sooner? I, I guess really is what I'm asking. And if 18 month is is the magic month, then I'm I'm happy with that. But if you can maybe just be giving me a little clearer, give me some insight on why it's going to take so long. Thank you, Ms. Oakley. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor McCann. Um, it will take us some time to do some research into uh, the types of software that are out there to uh, nail down the scope of really sort of specifically what we're looking for and probably work with our IT department um, and do some sort of request for information to see what, again, what tools are out there. Um, and, and again, to assess our data. So far, we've been speaking with you about our core infrastructure assets, but as, as you know, we have more um, and we would want to sort of get a better handle on all of our other data as well, just to see what sort of, um, foundation we would have available uh, to even implement a system. Okay, Ms. Oakley, I appreciate that. And I guess if I wanted a six month report, I could have to put that in writing, wouldn't I? You would. <laughs> so I'll uh, not do that and uh, say thank you. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Lehman. No, okay. I, I, I completely understand that, but I do understand a lot about data and I know this is a massive project like this will be and and wonderful to hear that miss maybe miss Oakley can expand this into different departments and use it on a even more grand level um, this is probably bigger than we can even imagine how big of a project this will be for staff so sorry kind of um, but 18 months I think is really fair okay um... Uh, I, I've sort of allowed a little procedural leeway here, um, but uh, the motions on the floor, uh, the, the new motion with the one different word, uh, are there any further comments or amendments? Uh, Council Morales, you have a question? I do have a question. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, Ms. Oakley, uh, earlier it was said that obviously there's gonna be a cost to this, that's just logical. Could you describe to us the cost of not having this? And that manifests itself currently in the gap. We call it infrastructure gap for assets and we call it financial gap, I guess, for, for water management. Uh, could you describe the cost of not doing this? Ms. Oakley. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councilor Morales. Um, with better data, we will always be able to make better decisions. And so while I'm quite comfortable in telling you about the infrastructure gap that exists today, um, I feel that you know if we have this sort of modeling tool um, we will perhaps be able, able to make better decisions um, and try to optimize some of our spending. Um, I, I, I think it remains to be seen what's, what um, specific scope we land on for the tool, but um, certainly better data will always lead to better decisions in my opinion. Perfect, uh, thank you. And I don't know, I don't think this needs an amendment. Um, so. I'll I will assume it's not, and please just clarify if it does need amendment, but if staff, when they do this report, I think it's my opinion, and Councillor Harris is, we're not just looking for you to find a product, by the way, that doesn't really exist in the market yet. All municipalities are really in this boat. That's why it's gonna take so long to develop it, and we're gonna be leaders and have so Council many- Morales, you did already speak to this, so. Sorry? 
Uh, you did already speak to most. No, no, there's a question in here, Mayor Lehman. Okay, if you, let me if you could get to your question. So the, since there's no really system in the market yet, um, could you as part of your report include um, the opportunities to qualify for FCM and other federal financing uh, for both sustainable growth, municipal funding, as well as possibly environmental, um, environmental uh, uh, grants of the sorts, because I think all these factors need to be taken into consideration when we get that report back. You don't need an amendment Ms. for that, Ms. Oakley, do you? So, yeah, I'll just remind members of council staff have delegated authority to apply for grants for anything that council has blessed. Uh, if we can get outside funding for anything the city does, staff can simply apply for those grants under delegated authority. But uh, Ms. Oakley, um, uh, maybe you could speak to whether or not there are funding opportunities you're aware of. Through you, Mayor Lehman, um, there are certainly grants available through FCM uh, through their Municipal Asset Management Planning Program um, and uh, possibly other grants available as well. And so we can certainly add that to the list. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, Councillor Morales. Anyone else on the motion? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, another question for Ms. Oakley. Uh, part of the data moving forward do you anticipate that this would also include our, uh, our, our water capacity, especially as we uh, continually get these applications uh, within the built boundary and uh, heightened density seems to be a common theme, obviously. And I know there are several areas where we don't necessarily know what our uh, wastewater capacity is currently. Uh, so do you envision that that will be part of this moving forward? Ms. Oakley. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey, uh, actually, I would say that those would be separate systems. Um, we do, the city does have a wastewater model um, as well as a water model, and we are always uh, working to improve those. Um, and, and those specific models are um, like an electronic representation of the water network or the wastewater, the sewer network um, throughout the city uh, and, and speak to the, the capacity and the flows that are available. Um, and um, and I, the modeling system that we're talking about, um, you know, t tonight, I believe, for the asset management planning is is almost like a financial modeling tool um, to look at how condition of assets will deteriorate and require more investment and um, and how that will change over time. I will let you know, though, that we are working actively on a project to improve our wastewater model um, to look at our sewer capacity throughout the city. Great, thank you. That uh, just eliminated my follow-up question I was going to ask. <laughs> okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. Any other comments, Councillor Thompson? Thanks, Mayor Lehman. I'll be very brief. Um, I guess information is very powerful, but uh, this is uh, something like you said about the bylaw officers. Be careful what you ask for. We do all these studies. We might realize we're in a forty million dollar gap, and uh, from the budgets I've sat on, we do an awful lot of cut, 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 and. Uh, that's why we're in this gapping. So I hope people realize that the information um, might hurt and uh, might make us, uh, you know, make uh, tough decisions. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Any other comments? Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. If through you, I had one quick question for Ms. Oakley. Miss um, Oakley, uh, We've had a good conversation about the um, uh, the thoughts around the um, community objectives and the community service measures and related to affordability. Just curious, it just kind of tweaks for me here. Would this um, amendment, this work, this report, and use of the data, would it help in some ways to inform um, uh, community service measures related to and the objectives related to affordability? Ms. Oakley. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harris. Um, we'll have to discuss, I think, with our um, financial team and how we are able to integrate uh, this type of model with our financial model that looks at our long range planning, um, because that's where a lot of our affordability measures of the city are considered. Uh, but certainly, we can't do the type of modeling that Councillor Harris and Councillor Morales are envisioning. Um, without looking at levels of service 
um, and and what we provide to the community in terms of um, in terms of those service levels. So that I, there will be discussion about affordability. Great, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Any other comments? Okay. First of all, uh, thank you very much, Councillors Harris and Morales. This is great work. Um, I'm I'm pleased at, at this amendment on a couple of levels. First of all, I'm a huge believer, of course, that uh, you know the more information you've got, the better information you've got, the better the decisions we make, and especially when it comes to infrastructure, the dollars associated with our choices around projects themselves are in the tens of millions quite often. Um, the cost of modeling software, I'm going to assume, will be in the thousands. Sometimes complex systems can be more than that. Uh, certainly, you know, something like an ERP system is much more than that. But if it's modeling software, regardless, it's no doubt going to be far less than the cost of decisions made with less information over time. So, uh, you know, I really agree with the thinking behind this um, and, and that you uh, sort of got a staff report with an asset management plan and said, no, actually, I'd like us to go further in terms of um, giving our staff the tools uh, to, to get even better at, uh, at asset management, which is, you know, the, the most boring title for one of the most important things we do uh, and try and get better at year after year. And the only way we can get better at it is by doing things like this. Uh, the other thing I would say is it's timely because we now have so much more data than we had 10 years ago between AMIs, uh, condition assessments, and some of the technologies that are available to give us the data. Um, I think we generally have an issue at the city right now where we're at that point in the curve where the amount of data we have about our own services and our own infrastructure has skyrocketed because of the availability of technology. But our own ability to analyze and use that data is still sometimes behind the, the data in terms of uh, the, the, the resources we bring to it and the investment that's been made in, in our own IT and analytic capacity. Um, I guess the third thing I'd say in favor of this amendment is, you know, lots of people have lots of dreams, but I am delighted that we have people in the corporate asset management department who, with all the things you could dream about in life, dream about having great asset management modeling software uh, because uh, you are very committed to your jobs. And I appreciate that, uh, that there are people out there who, who, who really want to see this. Although I'm making a joke of it, I'm, I'm actually serious about the point um, because I think we now have a, a culture uh, in this organization that says, give me the tools and, and I will be able to help you make better decisions, Council, and I will be able to help us ultimately do better for the taxpayer and for our residents. Um, so, you know, there's lots of amendments that come, come to General Committee and Council, but I'm really delighted by this one. So I'm going to vote yes with both hands. And I'll call the question. Uh, those vote. in favor, sorry, recorded vote, Councilor Morales? Okay, yep. uh, we can do a recorded vote. Um, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I will start with Councillor Ritma. Yes. Councillor Ilwin. Yes. Councillor Kungle. Yes. Deputy Mayor Ward. Yes. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. Councillor Harvey. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Morales. Yes. Councillor McCann. We. Oui. Mayor Lehman. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, members of council. On the main motion as amended, section C of the general committee report, water asset management plan. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of section C as amended. Anybody opposed? None. That carries unanimously. Thank you again. Good discussion. Uh, section D, please. Sorry, the reason we're planning section D, we're planning it's in fact the planning committee yep. report. So planning okay. committee from October 19th is the one remaining. Okay, move on without second by Councillor Thompson. The planning committee report dated October 19th, 2021 is circulated to be received. Okay, it is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward and seconded by Councillor Thompson that the planning committee report dated October 19th, 2021 is circulated to be received. It's to receive the presentation we had last week on the One City, One Vision, One Plan draft official plan update. It's just to receive it. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor? Anybody opposed to section C? None. That carries. Thank you. And that completes the committee reports. Uh, we have no deferred business on tonight's agenda. Um, so we'll proceed to the presentations, uh, which uh, we have two tonight. The first is from the Simcoe County Food Council concerning the Food Council and Simcoe County Food Security Framework. So I'd like to call on Mike Ryan and Bonnie North of the Simcoe County Food Council to provide this presentation to Barry City Council.
Okay, there we've got both of you now. Welcome to council and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I'm just gonna kick off our presentation tonight. My name is Bonnie North. I've been privileged to be a member of the Simcoe County Food Council since its, um, its inception last year. And tonight we are just going to introduce you to the Food Council and tell you what the Food Council is all about. And I can honestly say that it has been wonderful learning experience to uh, have someone like me who is really invested in our food systems and how our food systems um, interact with our municipalities to be able to um, learn from the guidance and leadership of the coordinators, um, Mike Ryan and Courtney O'Neill. And this presentation will uh, let you know what we're about. And so I'll turn it over to Mike right now. No, thanks for your kind words. Um, if the clerk would share the presentation, that would be... Really invested in our food systems and how our food systems Sorry, getting, uh, um, interact with our municipalities feedback, to be able there. to... There we go. I'm sure I just heard something just like that. Mr. Ryan, over to you. So we'll see if it works this time. Um, so th good evening and, th and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, our goal um, here tonight is to raise awareness about what the Food Council is and what the Simcoe County Food Security Framework is. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it's really important. Um, my control? No. Okay. It's really important to know where we've come from when uh, we want to see where we're going. Um, so in 2013, Simcoe County had the Simcoe County Food and Agricultural Charter. Um, and after that, there was a real awareness that food security in Simcoe County was an issue. There was a ministerial round table, which uh, groups and members across Simcoe County attended in 2017. There was a local food security forum. And out of that came um, a real highlight that it was a local issue that needed to be studied further. And so Simcoe County County, the Simcoe County Council put out a request for proposal, which uh, Ecoeconomics was retained to create what became the Simcoe County Food Security Framework, which needs a better acronym. Um, next slide, please. So out of that framework, which was adopted by County Council in 2019, um, the Food Council is highlighted inside that framework as the body which is actually going to implement the seven goals within the framework that we'll go over. So it's a blueprint for furthering awareness and coordination and development of approaches designed to enhance food security for all residents in Simcoe County. And the Food Council itself, on the next slide, is seen as a collaborative group um, in a constellation model um, to really implement the seven goals of the framework. Um, next slide, please. So we have working tables, which are the people work in groups and individuals working on the ground towards a food secure Simcoe County and the food council as a whole above it, which is a flow of information from um, collaborating working tables, um, policy challenges that they'll come up against as they're trying to do their work in Simcoe County. And the food council is that advocacy group at the top that can advocate for policy changes, whether they be municipal, federal, provincial, um, or, or at any level. Um, so these dedicated working tables are working towards these seven goals within the framework. And it's really about supporting and developing capacity. Uh, lots of times we have people doing great work in one area of Simcoe County that don't know what's happening in North Simcoe or South Simcoe. How do we bring these people together and leverage their experience, leverages the challenge and roadblocks they've had in the past so that other groups can move forward quickly and, and address food security in Simcoe County, um, whether it be community food security or household food security. Next slide, please. So the vision is a sustainable and equitable, secure local food system in Simcoe County that recognizes food as a human right, that it's interconnected food system where safe, sufficient, nutritious, culturally appropriate food is financially and physically accessible to everyone through dignified means and where people are actively working towards realizing a more food secure Simcoe County. Next slide, please. 
So there's seven goals within the framework which address household food insecurity and community food security. So the first one is raising awareness and understanding about household food insecurity in Simcoe County, that it is a real problem. Supporting income and housing solutions to reduce household food insecurity for households who are underserved or marginalized, because at the end of the day, household food insecurity um, is a financial problem. That's people don't have the physical means to access food. Number three is to increase physical access to enough nutritious food for all. Number four is to improve community food literacy. Number five is to support community food infrastructure and policy to support the agri-food sector in Simcoe County, which is a big economic driver in Simcoe County. And number six is to foster Simcoe County's food traditions along with Indigenous food knowledge and culture within the county. And number seven is to support a countywide collaboration towards a food secure Simcoe County. Next slide, please. So we launched last October because COVID is an amazing time to launch a new initiative. Um, and the first working table that came together was the food banks of Simcoe County. And it, when COVID hit, the, um, the county had brought them together. And in July, we kind of took this mantle and pushed it on because we felt it really fit within our umbrella. And so once a month, we meet with around 20 food banks across Simcoe County and really address challenges, opportunities, what's successful at some food banks. And we always have someone at that at that working table that has had that challenge before is working on a similar issue and a real leverage of experience um, and moving forward faster than we would independently. Um, the second work, working table is food literacy and food programs. They began as separate uh, separate working tables, but it was really felt that they overlap well. So um, community gardens or community food programs oftentimes have experience, uh, people with experience in different areas that really overlap with food literacy and people that want to run food literacy programs. Um, agriculture and local food systems, lots of talk about um, how to support agribusiness in Simcoe County, as well as farmland preservation and what that means within Simcoe County. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is an important working table because as we'll see later in the statistics, um, people from marginalized communities suffer two to three times the rate of household food insecurity. And lots of times serving people with dignity, you need to have people with lived experience at the table, people coming from um, marginalized communities to really speak to how can we best serve those people that are actually facing with the challenges and not tailoring programs towards um, when volunteers are available, perhaps. Um, Community Gardens of Simcoe County is a really um, collaborative group that's working on um, governance structure and putting tools together to really leverage programs and, and more sustainability. Um, and then the first two goals of the framework really overlap with um, the work of the Simcoe County Poverty Reduction Task Force. And so rather than starting a working table um, for goals one and two, we felt that it was a lot better to leverage the experience of the people at the PRTG and see how can we help support the work that they've been doing over the past few years and vice versa, how can they support us reach the goals within the framework. And through all these six working tables, we often run into finding out where community assets are, whether it be a food literacy program, whether it be agribusiness, whether it be a community garden, uh, whether it's the food banks. Often we're looking for something that has a food asset and where can we find a collective resource um, to know where this infrastructure exists. Um, do we need to apply for funding for a community kitchen or is there one up the road that someone didn't know about um, that a municipality might have? Um, so that's a real task that we're working towards. We have many groups within Simcoe County that have done them in the past. Lots of government funding has gone into them and often they sit as PDFs on a shelf or they're not updated or they're not collaborative enough to work with each other. So that's a real thing that we're excited about trying to work with a bunch of groups that are working in this area or have an interest in this and how do we make it um, updatable and, and really relevant to the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. So it's, it's really a broad overlapping scope with many different factors. Next slide, please. So often in these discussions, we talk about community food security and household food insecurity. Um, and it's important to distinguish what each is because um, although they overlap, 
um, they're not necessarily this, they aren't the same thing and they don't always have the same solution. So community food security is really talking about access to food and the availability of food within the county. So a condition in which the community residents have access to safe, culturally appropriate, nutritionally adequate diet through a sustainable food system that maximizes community self-reliance and social justice. When we talk about local food or we talk about processing capacity to the agri-food sector, um, these things are fall under community food security and the availability of food. But that doesn't mean that someone can financially afford the food. And so household food insecurity um, is experienced when an individual or household lacks the financial resources to access food. Um, and not only not always does that mean that they can't afford food at all, but but they're skipping meals or stretching food to feed their family. And so it can be influenced by a variety of things that have to do with cost of living, job security, social assistance rates, and many other factors. Um, and is a real issue in Simcoe County, in the province, and nationally. So next slide, please. We see federally that one in eight Canadian households are food insecure, one in six children, um, 11% of couples with children um, suffer household food insecurity, but a, a single parent, if they're male, suffers twice that rate, and if they're female, triple that rate of household food insecurity. Highest rates of food insecurity are found among households which identify as Indigenous or Black, marginalized communities suffering over almost triple rates as well. Next slide, please. Provincially, we see very similar statistics. Um, and so the health units chronic disease prevention unit is interested in this and there's no money for food is census campaign because healthcare costs for household food insecure individuals is 120% of those that are food secure. Um, so it's a big issue at the health unit and healthcare costs. How can we um, alleviate the burden on that system, but also help people get the food and nutrition that they need. Next slide, please. Again, locally, we see that we match the federal statistic of one in eight um, families that are household food insecure. This infographic comes from the health unit and their no money from food is census campaign um, and really here to live in the permanent record and, and analyze and some interesting statistics. Um, for brevity and time, I'll kind of skip through um, the next two slides. Um, but it really is a big issue in Cinco County, provincially and federally and something that we need to look at. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so what does this mean at the municipal level? Um, measuring and monitoring community food assets is important to know what is in your, in your community and how can we leverage existing resources and networks using these assets to improve community food security and household food insecurity. The health unit recommends from the No Money From Food is Census campaign that a municipality annually reviews the prevalence of household food insecurity and poverty in their area, invest in local infrastructure to help reduce poverty, like affordable housing, affordable transit, and active transportation, and policies and programs to support employment training and entrepreneurship. Because household food insecurity at its core is a financial issue, Anything you can do to promote living wage employers or attracting employment to your area allows people to attain the employment that they need um, to reach household food security. Next slide, please. The Food Council's goal here tonight is to raise awareness about who we are, what we are, and the framework and, and what we've been doing. And so some of the ways that we suggest that the council can help the, the food council in its work is just like county council endorsing the Simcoe County Food Security Framework, acknowledging that household food insecurity is a priority and recognizing municipalities have a role to play through planning and economic development, exporting community food assets in your community and identifying a point person to collaborate with the Simcoe County Food Council on future work and at many different municipalities, this takes many different roles. Some of them have a staff person that overlaps. Their, their work plan overlaps with one of the seven goals within the framework. Sometimes it's just identifying who's the best person for us to get in contact with when we have issues um, at the council, at the food council, or at our working tables. Who's the best person to contact so that we're not barraging the clerk all the time? And sometimes it's someone on on council that is really interested in this work that really wants to pursue it. Um, so there's many different ways of identifying a point person to help with our work. Next slide, please. 
So these uh, are some of the founding members of the Simcoe County Food Council since we la launched last October, and some of the organizations that were involved in the founding of the Food Council. And uh, a big thank you to all these people that have provided guidance and, and they've volunteered their time um, to help move this project forward. And certainly not a comprehensive list of the many people, the many groups and individuals that sit at the working tables working towards um, these goals. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'd certainly entertain any questions if there are any, and, and thank you for having us. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. I'm sure there might be at least a few questions from members of council. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, through you. I don't have a question, and I don't, uh, it's more of a suggestion. If we need a point person, um, Councillor Kongel, like, there's like no question. She is the perfect person to, I'm not putting more work on your plate, pun intended, um, but it, uh, how could we not say that though, really? <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, Councillor Congo, you're next on my list. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Thank you. And it's nice. it's been actually an interesting two years of COVID where I've seen many members of council and other members across communities really identifying um, food insecurity and becoming more aware of it. And so I guess my, in line with a representative, um, maybe a question to staff, do we have a point person at this time? And I also then, and I'm looking at, um, uh, Councillor Elman, would this fit within our membership of the active transportation sustainability on the sustainability side? And maybe if so, if we don't have a staff committed, um, perhaps we look at um, a conversation at our upcoming meeting about how do we interact within that mandate with uh, food and security in this council? So I guess I'll look to staff. If, do we have anyone committed that sure, would be um, a fit? I'll go to CAO Press. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Kungle, no, we don't have a staff member committed to that. Follow, follow up, if I may, Your Worship. Sure. Um, through you to staff, would you recommend a best process or would you uh, prefer staff come back around maybe a proposed recommendation of where a potential staff member may fit or if it already fits within the membership of active transportation sustainability and we could look at maybe opening our terms of reference unless staff would like to see a different direction? to maybe ask a representative of the Food Council to be part of that, or at least receiving minutes or an open conversation to attending as a guest on an ongoing basis? So I'll actually jump in here. Um, I, I, there's, uh, we had a conversation around this in my office today and we thought we would uh, offer uh, that there's a staff member in my office who runs a food program at the moment uh, and has closely interacted with a number of the other food programs over the course of COVID. Um, uh, you may also remember her work um, at Lauren Wild uh, during the Shift Government project uh, on uh, on a couple of pilots there too. Um, so, although we haven't fully had that conversation with staff yet, um, uh, and it may be that appropriate for somebody within the administration rather than a member of my office staff, um, but uh, certainly we have an interest and some background in it, as at least as a liaison to the Food Council, for what it's worth, Councillor Kungel. Thank you. I'll, I'll leave it there, Your Worship, and would look forward to hearing who maybe staff might be recommending forward. But um, uh, I do have some questions for the presenters. Um, thank you, um, Bonnie and Mike. And I guess I'll, I'll redirect it to either of you how best you want to handle the, the question. And so also sitting with Councillor Harvey on the Health Unit Board, I often think a bit about what are those policies that exist that help or hinder um, our ability to move food. So often we have conversations around food handling, safety of food, um, and I have found that often it's the transition points of sometimes there's an abundance of food or a donation of food, and how do we effectively look at where policies can enable um, individuals to be um, at less risk around how they share excess food, so we're reducing food waste. Are there policies that you've come across through the Food Council that either sit at a public health level or at a municipal level that you think uh, need to be examined and looked at to, to, to enable the sharing of food with less resident risk or business risk around how food is moved? I think it's, uh, Bonnie, did you wanna make a comment or? No, I was, uh, no, I was just gonna say, Mike, you'd be the best one to answer this question. <laughs> okay. 
hopefully. Um, food's a complicated issue because it overlaps with with a lot of CFIA, provincial regulations, health unit regula um, regulations, and um, definitely conversations at the student nutrition program, um, how COVID has affected how the student nutrition program distributes food, um, and definitely some strong partnerships um, for a, a um, a working model happening in Aurelia with the sharing place there on um, on how to um, connect the student nutrition program with people that have the capacity to deliver that food. And often the times um, with food donations or food recovery, it's it's the capacity um, to be a consistent um, a consistent not supplier but a consistent recipient of donations that that those people are looking for. Um, so definitely lots of discussions around that specific regulations. Um, I'm not really going to address here tonight, um, uh, but safe food handling practices. There's often um, often trying to run student nutrition programs or other programs in spaces that were um, not designed to present regulations that the health units looking for or provincially mandated um, regulations might mandate today. So it's definitely discussions we're having about how to work around some of them because sometimes the health units uh, hands are tied. Um, and often it's a discussion making sure that um, you're reaching out to the health unit at the beginning of the process, not halfway through or through the end, because it leads to a lot of um, conflict or um, uh, disgruntlement when um, you've designed a program or work designed a program and then go to the health unit or, or go for that professional advice on how to seek how does it fit within regulations and when um, when you started that process it's it's a lot smoother and so um, the health units um, always been good to reach out and, and work with us in that area too. Follow up, if I may, Worship. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan, and, and perhaps uh, on on the piece around kind of assets and infrastructure that support kind of the handling and access to food. So we're in the middle of some pretty great conversation about what is our future precinct look like? Um, where would we plan in the future to have a commercial fridge so we could actually be engaging groups like Urban Pantry and others that are doing food prep to have a dedicated space um, with a little less vulnerability about how programs are offered. Um, I'm also seeing, I believe it's a town of Innisfil that has through a lot of work over the past year actually launched a community fridge um, around donations going to that. And we've seen our food bank start this pilot with churches around food pantries. And so there's a lot of great momentum and I'm, and I'm glad that the council exists, but I'm wondering about as a city, are there particular pieces that you would say would be kind of core infrastructure um, resources that would be important to food security initiatives around providing public access to um, programming through a commercial kitchen and, and does the city have a role in that? I think there's lots of great models with Community Food Centers Canada or, or community kitchens and food programs that are run in that. Um, sometimes it's not regulations you run across but liability that um, municipalities don't want to take on um, especially with uh, those food pantries or or community fridges. There's um, lots of times um, a balk at the liability of running those programs. Um, definitely some great models out there to look at when you go um, down that route and something that we'd love to further that discussion with. Thank you. And then lastly, I guess I would say, um, I'll put the lens back on food insecurity and, and I guess what I saw through COVID, which was this huge adoption of the Good Food Box, which was historically a uh, um, Barry Community Health Centre and Public Health Initiative were for $17 once a month you can cost share into uh, access and I believe um, if I'm hoping not to misquote we've saw like a 200 uh, boxes around December and November of last year and they've continued to climb and people are purchasing those to then give through Barry Families Unite or other initiatives or to shelters and transitional homes. Um, and that food is being used for programming. And where I see the vulnerability um, in the lens of where we're, we are already seeing food insecure homes is where some of this great programming is provided by not-for-profits that don't have ongoing secured funding. And does the council look at, at a Simcoe County wide, who's providing a lot of this work and what's that vulnerability looking like when it's a lot of grant funding volunteer driven um, and perhaps um, programs that are a bit more 
at risk of um, not being able to meet demand just because they don't have a site to operate in or they're not part of a hub and spoke model and they're kind of operating virtually or on the side um, in kind. I think we saw with COVID a great um, uptake and in interest in local food, lots of conversation around um, donating food and, and food insecurity or people's inability to access food as we saw employment shift. Um, but those beginning discussions at the food banks working table last spring, um, lots of government funding, lots of donations from the community um, when there was a focus on it. But there were red flags immediately last spring um, that in the 08 financial crisis, it was about a year and a half before food bank usage peaked where people are actually seeking assistance and reach that point because there's such a, a stigma associated with household food insecurity. About one in four people that are household food insecure actually will access a food bank or, or supports or programs that are meant to help them. Um, so people will burn through their savings. They'll do everything they can before they finally admit, yes, I need help. And, and even accessing a food bank, um, three to four days of food is all that they're receiving when, when they do attend those. Um, so we've seen lots of, of different programs and different models to help people that are household food insecure. But at the end of the day, um, poverty and, and employment is going to help a lot more people um, in getting out of household food insecurity than, than food banks or, or donations are. And so last spring when we saw an influx of donations to food banks and financial assistance coming from government that was tied, you have to spend it within four months, you have to spend it within five months. Um, their first question was, what do we do in a year and a half when the people that are su suffering household food insecurity currently actually go to access our services? Um, and it, it, it's similar with other programs. So really serving with dignity, developing programs um, that make that reduce barriers to access so that people can access that food. Um, and yeah, funding is a huge issue. We've seen um, a Canadian infrastructure grant that um, a few people in Simcoe County have been able to access to um, expand fridge capacity or, or different areas within their food program or, or service. Um, and, and that definitely needs to continue. Um, funding is always an issue in the not-for-profit sector or, or for these things. Um, they're not... Um, uh, they're not ribbon cutting ceremonies always that people talk about and and often um, it's something that we need to bring to light and talk about more often to ensure that the funding is there to keep these programs going and ensuring they have impact and reduce barriers to access to, uh, to be servable to the communities they need to serve. Thank you. That's all my questions for Mr. Ryan. I do have a question of staff after. Should I hold at this time, Your Worship? No, why don't you go ahead and ask that last question, Councilor Connell. And I'm not sure if I'm in unfairly directing at you or, or, or staff through your office, but we had that presentation by um, the uh, Healthy Berry Project by Mr. Fang, and we talked about food deserts, and we talked about data and demographics around um, food deserts and access to food. Um, we also have the Health Accord, and there's been uh, great progress through your office on that. Where would you recommend best next steps could go around having a holistic conversation with respects to how do we as a municipality and ensure that and what role do we have to play around um, helping to reconcile gaps and access to food? There was some great work done around Connected Core where we actually did food share tables. I know the public um, had great feedback to that. I'd, I'd like to see where we can move this conversation to broader dialogue about what role we could play. Sure. Um, thanks, Councillor Kungel. So I, I was pleased to see in this presentation the, the discussion of some mapping because um, what's happened during COVID is, uh, you know, we live in such a compassionate community, there's been an explosion of new programs, everything from well-meaning single individuals who've started their own to expansion of programs to different agencies that might not have really like my own office, been involved directly in food security who, who, uh, who, who did move into that space, um, seeing a need and feeling the need. Um, you all get the emails from Ms. McAlpine on, um, on the weekly meetings of some of the programs that are active in downtown Barrie. I think the issue right now, uh, if I might, is that there are so many uh, and sometimes some overlap, but definitely still some gaps as well. So to me, it starts with getting everybody together and, um, uh, and there isn't a, a, a summit meeting afoot. 
coming in about three weeks that's um, actually been organized by one of the groups involved in food security already, and I know they've been in touch with the Food Council, uh, the coordinator from Simcoe County, uh, so thank you for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, so th that's where it starts. Uh, you know, I think we need to take an uh, assessment of where there may, there may still be gaps in the community, and also where we've got multiple organizations sort of delivering the same thing. Um, and then we can all work together. And one, you know, I sort of think of the Simcoe County Alliance to End Homelessness. There's no equivalent structure yet. Um, the, I think the Simcoe County Food Council uh, is probably it on a countywide basis. There's no meeting of the groups yet in Barrie, uh, but they're putting the tables together. So, so my take is uh, I know uh, the, the Food Council is supportive of that locally driven effort that's coming out of one of the groups. And then, um, uh, you know, I think from, from that discussion can be uh, how the Food Council goes forward. Um, I think it's fair to say, and you may want to ask Ms. McAlpine about this, I mean, the city attempts to support and facilitate the work of the groups, um, but, I, but I, I don't believe yet there's, a, you know, been a single ask to us from the county or to member municipalities from the county or those sorts of things that says, you know, here's your, here's your to-do list on how to, how to help food security. I think we all just do that uh, out of the interests of, of supporting those who need it in the community. Um, so I guess that's a long way of saying I think, I think what's coming is a badly needed meeting of all the minds in Barrie because there's been such growth in the number of active organizations and individuals. And out of that hopefully can come a little more organized approach to it. And, uh, and I see the, the, the work that the Food Council's done is exactly the structure that, that is needed and probably needed in Barrie. I have no more further questions and thank you. Okay, uh, any further questions? Councilor Morales and then Deputy Mayor Ward. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, great presentation, uh, Mr. Ryan, Ms. North, um, especially slide 14 and 15. Uh, it summarizes it perfectly. This is what we want to either to see or uh, from council. Um, do you guys consider yourself an advocacy group or do you consider yourself a logistics and operations group? So the goal of the council is to be um, an advocacy group um, advocating for policy changes, um, but in our, but also um, helping to coordinate and collaborate um, all this work within Simcoe County, really um, the go-to group in Simcoe County for, um, and really in the first year, it's really growing into what do the members of the food council want the food council to be as well right um being an organization still only a year old um it, it it's a it's, it's shoes that need to be stepped on its initial um its initial uh framework was funded by the county of simcoe so how does the food council step out of the county of simcoe um into the community and and what role does it want to play how active does it want to play an advocacy role and how active does it want to play in that boots on the ground role so um i'd say it's it's a work in progress right perfect and yeah uh, thank you mr ryan I, and i can tell by your presentation it's not a bad thing to have this identity crisis it's a good thing based on the age of your organization the reason i brought those points up is again if if you guys see yourself as an operation in logistics you can grow to become the hub in the wheel for the city and likely the region. If you are not that, your advocacy, that's still a very important job. You're just a spoke in that wheel, um, which actually, you know, we're getting a new uh, dynamic reporting system for water and I'm gonna have to get a new password because I'm, uh, I'm joking because Mayor Lehman hacked my notes here that I was writing. Great point earlier, which is about that summit. Like I literally had SCADA on my bingo here, uh, Mayor Lehman, that you got. When you think of housing affordability, you think of SCADA, if you're a realtor, if you're a developer, if you have land, an estate donation from, as a family, um, it kind of filters back to SCADA and, uh, you know, and, and they go from there. So again, Mayor Lehman's points is, I didn't know there was a summit coming or a gathering, that's, that's incredible. Hopefully at that gathering, if it does occur, the different stakeholders, uh, Ms. North and Ms. Ryan, can come together and say, okay, who's advocacy, who's operations, who's logistics? Because what I often see in this issue is there's lots of duplication, there's lots of waste, and I don't mean food, what I mean is efforts. And no effort is wasted, but inefficiency um, can be bad, right? This is really where the different groups can come together, whether it be neighborhood associations, uh, condo fords, uh, different associations, and really work together uh, to leverage resources, volunteers, um, and connections 
I, I guess my question to you is, Mr. Ryan, Ms. Ms., uh, Ms. North, do you see a scenario in, let's say, six months where you or the appropriate representative can come back to council and clarify to the corporation um, what the model might look like moving forward after this possible summit? Uh, that way we can more easily work with the conglomerate and see how we can help. I think definitely the advocacy role and preventing duplication through the collaborations of the working tables is a huge, um, a huge and important step that we are definitely trying to work towards. Um, the problem goes back to funding. Um, funding for the Food Council is annual. So um, do we really want to set ourselves up as the hub um, or the infrastructure for Simcoe County when, when we don't know, do we have funding January 1st for it to continue? Um, is that a sustainable model? Um, we're, not, um, we're not a charitable organization that can apply for funding. Um, so really about preventing duplication, bringing three or four groups that are working in the same space. Is there someone that wants to be a lead agency that applies for that funding, that applies for that grant? And how do those four organizations, five organizations, 20 organizations across Simcoe County leverage that grant into something that prevents duplication? Um, and everybody's working towards that same goal and not running over the same speed bumps um, one after the other. Um, so in six months, will I be able to tell you, are we the, the the sustainable hub to house this, um, I would say not until the Simcoe County Food Council has a stable funding source. Okay, it, it's often chicken and egg, right? Funding sometimes comes to <laughs> organizations that are, yeah, that, that know their, their mission, vision and, and operations. But my other question was going to be to the mayor as, as to whether uh, Connected Core and Shift Government can can assist and become maybe that point person and resource. But then again, I don't know what the ask is of you guys because you almost have to have that self-discovery process about what you are in that wheel with the other organizations. So maybe once we do know, we can see maybe in a future budget what Shift Government Connected Core can assist. And then I had another one here. Do you have connections with major gro grocers and even trucking companies, things of that sort? What I'm getting at is I love community gardens. They're great. The value I see in them is therapeutic and engagement and mental health. I don't see the actual food value as much as others. That doesn't mean we don't we shouldn't do them. They're great. They're about education, lifestyle, re-education, et cetera. But like one phone call, one pen stroke with a partnership with Loblaws or uh, another major provide, food provider would do tenfold or more what community gardens do. So it is an all solutions approach, but I'm wondering if um, again, the, your current council has the connections in the industry to, to leverage this. And I'll give, a, I'll give a shout out that I've observed. Uh, I believe Mr. Jones uh, with Vertical Farming has done significant work with uh, the uh, Janice Lake King Garden. And that's the kind of connections I'm talking about, connecting people with industry that can move a lot of food, a lot of volume, and make an impact in a phone call or in a pen stroke that would have taken hundreds of community gardens. Are you at that point where you're leveraging those connections or is it still an evolution? Those connections are definitely out there. The problem becomes with community groups that are able to receive those donations. So there is an organization um, inside your municipality that receives five, 600,000 pounds of donated produce from the the grocers of of, of Barry and, and and growers in the Holland Marsh and, and different um, different um, people in that industry that are looking to donate food. The problem and that's a, a massive scale, um, but there's not many people that can take 40 tons of carrots or uh, take these donations consistently. And no grocer wants to save all this save all this food or, or go through the work of, of doing it when one week someone shows up to take it and the next week they don't because they have some um, some of the um, programs within Simcoe County, they don't have fridge space, they don't have a loading dock that can take skids. All these things hinder. Um, so are you able to make those calls? Yes. Are there organizations that have the capacity to absorb 
those donations, um, a limited few within Simcoe County, and and definitely in the in the works of one of our discussions, along with the student nutrition program, is kind of the start and that the chicken and the egg. What we've been working on, of of trying to work with those donations, people that have the capacity to absorb those donations. How do we how do we leverage that, right? Um, so it's definitely something that we're working on. And I think when we saw people donating to to food banks or different food programs at the beginning of COVID, um, it's important to highlight um, the impact that the commodity organizations across the province had. Um, so whether it be the cattlemen or, or dairy farmers of Ontario donated a million liters of milk to feed Ontario, which was then distributed back um, to the municipalities that it came from. Um, and so we saw a massive shift in industry as restaurants were closed down and food service. And um, that food didn't go to waste. It got donated to Feed Ontario. So um, there was skids and, and truckloads of food that was coming into Simcoe County um, donated from the commodity organizations. Um, and then it becomes who actually has the capacity to absorb it, right? Yeah. Um, so definitely an infrastructure issue yeah. in making those phone calls at the moment chicken and egg you can't get the 40 capacity you can't get capacity until you're proven as the go-to um there's definitely some great examples across Simcoe County of, of food recovery programs that are running right now that um can we leverage them can we work with other organizations to utilize that space or or grow that space um and and not have to redevelop the cold storage the walk-in freezers um how do we get that that movement of food away from those um that infrastructure that does have the capacity to absorb those donations out to other organizations that that um, transportation right across and, the county is an issue. And and Mr. North, Mr. Ryan, once this summit, if and when it does happen, I, I'd definitely be happy to connect with you. I, for a fact, know that there is at very least one upper management um, employee for a major grocer of this sort that lives in Barrie, and very informal chats, just very conversational. Uh, these organizations some of them are happy to do these kind of initiatives but you got to make it painless frictionless for them the moment you start not making it easy the conversation never goes anywhere so absolutely the talk about capacity it's some of these decision makers actually or influencers actually live in the city they're not in the gta um one final question for miss uh miss banfield if she's on the call miss cook is she on the call she is okay miss banfield Often we talk about community and bonusing and things of that nature in our planning, um, in our planning documents and our and, and our processes. Is there an opportunity uh, as part of the OP to flesh out what community benefits and bonusing means, specifically in regards to food security? What I mean by that is, uh, we've started to do you know cash in lieu of parkland, uh, community benefits such as art installations with mid uh, missing middle mid rise development. Can we add to the conversation about uh, food security? And what I mean by that, I see an end goal, a vision where when density increases residential or industrial, event, you know, a certain amount of money through proper municipal act processes is put away into some sort of food security benefits uh, fund where in the future, maybe one of a major industrial building, uh, a certain amount of square footage is set aside um, by the uh, developer, and that is now becomes the hub where organizations such as uh, the council before us operate and have that freezer capacity, that storage capacity, that drop-off capacity, and nobody had to fund it with, with one-off grants, and no one level of government is on the hook for it. Essentially, the growth that we allowed over the, the pr preceding years paid for it because our municipality properly allocated it using uh, the legislative powers. Is that something that we can look into? Uh, yeah, three, so, Mary sorry, Ms. Banfield, I'll just, uh, so the specific question, I guess, is can community benefit charges fund food security infrastructure? Uh, through you, Mary Lehman, to um, Council Morales, um, community benefits can um, fund many things. And yes, I think that absolutely it could. And many times we talk about us getting counselor ward specific initiatives through community benefits uh, so if that was something that council wanted uh, then for sure it could be explored okay thank you okay uh, any other members of council uh deputy mayor ward uh, thank you mayor lehman and i just and thank you for the presentation i just have two brief questions 
Uh, one is, um, is there a role for here in Barrie or across the county, a role for farmers markets and food security? Farmers markets definitely play a huge role in community food access, community food security. Um, we have uh, farmers markets that um, at the end of the day are donating produce to food programs that hasn't sold at the farmers market. Um, they play an important role in, in agri-food and in agri-food economic development. Um, in times though, when we're talking about um, farmers markets and we're talking about the financial ability to purchase food, um, is the farmers market the most economical way for someone that only has $5 um, to get the meals they need to feed their family. Um, so do they have a role to play in community food security? Absolutely. In agri-food business um, and economic development, they do in, um, in the experience of them. Um, so it's kind of a convoluted question or convoluted answer, but um, hopefully I hit it. No I, no, I appreciate the answer. And the second question I had is, what is a community kitchen? Not a commercial kitchen. You were talking about community kitchens. I wasn't sure what they are. Should unmute. Um, a community food kitchen. Um, so there's many examples, especially through Community Food Centers Canada. The local in Stratford is one that's been very successful. And so the idea is that not only is it a place where people can come together and um, cook meals together and run food literacy programs, run community meal programs out of a community kitchen where um, once a week, um, people can just come to the community kitchen, cook a meal together, learn food literacy skills and eat a meal together. And um, social isolation and, and the mental health um, concerns um, can not be addressed through this way, but, but social connections is a, is a valuable part of building a sense of community, building um, uh, infrastructure. Um, how can you use that community kitchen when these programs aren't running? Can um, someone that wants running uh, canning or preserves that they want to sell and value add? Can it be rented out for that when it's not in use in community food programs? Um, sometimes with a walk-in freezer, if they're there, they can accept donations and then people can come for a community meal. They can come for a food literacy program or, or whatever it might be, and then take whatever they want out of a, a kind of a pantry idea or a community uh, fridge idea as well. They take many forms, many roles, many many structures um there's definitely some great examples across ontario and across canada okay hey, would they tend to be on it's the same location as commercial kitchens or do they tend to be for example church halls or or does it vary across the province and where they are they're usually a not always but they they usually are a standalone um building that is running a variety of programs out of them but um where do you get the funding to develop that initially right and so is there uh is there a church hall is there a municipally owned commercial kitchen um because you need to meet health regulations it needs to be a commercial kitchen that they're working out of so how do you can you use that infrastructure to develop community food programs and then grow into a community kitchen model or or create sustainable programs that then demands the need of a, of a community kitchen or um what it might be um reinventing a food bank is a book um also that that is really um interesting on on this kind of thing too of, of and we see a lot of um uh community food programs that we would call food banks that are transitioning or are growing and, and expanding their services expanding their roles to serve with dignity and provide other services than just three days worth of food okay thank you i appreciate that councilor Reba. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for the presentation, um, and, and also thank you for all the hard work that you do and all your organizations and all the people that are involved in, uh, in helping out in this area. Um, this council, I think, has often looked at, uh, said, you know what the real answer is, is we have to start getting after root causes. And what struck me from your presentation uh, again is that the root cause of food insecurity is poverty and I'd like you to comment on that and I'd like to know whether you agree with that and whether or not I mean I know all the efforts that you and your groups are making but isn't the real answer 
um, a reduction in poverty, that getting more money into hands of people and then um, all of the food banks would, uh, would go away, or many of them would? I'd like your comment on that. Many um, food banks initiatives would say success is when I'm out of business. Um, but but poverty is the is the root issue of household food insecurity. So the the framework and the food council covers a variety of different goals and, and roles. But um, household food insecurity itself um, is a poverty issue that that people are not earning enough money to actually purchase food. Um, and so we see in the statistics that a single male in OW um, spends about 130% of their supplement on food and living expenses before they can have a phone that they can apply for jobs or, or anything else. And so um, providing an environment where you're attracting employers and providing employment that can pay a living wage and, and get people out of poverty um, will eliminate the need for a food bank. Affordable transit, right? Like if, if, if there is affordable transit that can take someone to their place of employment, to a place where they can purchase affordable food, um, that's money that's saved that they can then go and purchase food or spend in the economy. So um, the root cause is, is poverty of household food insecurity, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Reitma. Any other questions or comments on the presentation? Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Lehman, I'll be very quick. Um, Mr. Ryan, you, you mentioned that you do some advocate and lo lobbyist work to change some policies. I've been working with a resident in regards to a neighborhood pantry, and I think you can appreciate the liability for a city as, you know, it's, it's sad, but we live in a world where if something goes wrong, they sue the city, you know, they, they don't normally sue faith-based groups and stuff like that. Has, have you made any headway, um, like almost along the lines of the Good Samaritan, uh, you know, where we're not liable, like levels of government that, you know, we're the end user, so the laws above us were governed by on the liability side? It's definitely a concern. Um, as far as only being active for a year so far, um, it's something we've talked about. How do we, um, the, the challenge there is so massive when it comes to federal and, and provincial legislation on food distribution, on whether it's current, on, um, on changing laws takes, it takes a big active. So um, it's definitely in discussions. Um, being had in that area and hopefully at the food summit and and as the community food uh, community uh, community fridge in uh, in Innisfil and as those discussions are had with municipalities can we um, can we find a way where where both can thrive and that's active and and what do we need to actually advocate for because it's such um, a shotgun of different issues that provide um, that liability challenge with with um, food because there's so many different jurisdictions and, and health unit that overlap and it's distribution and, and availability. So um, definitely a note I'll make and take back. I wanted to thank you for your presentation. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Just on top of Councillor Thompson's uh, question, specifically, do you have uh, provincial or federal bill that you are looking to get passed to help with this um, liability? So currently we work with a number of uh, coalitions that are that are working on that that are more developed than we have been having only been around for a year. Um, the only one that we have um, supported that I can pull off the top of my head would be the student the student nutrition um, bill bill 216 that was um, is in second reading at the provincial parliament. Um, that we've been advocating for through the food literacy program and the healthy school network um, that would be the, the one thing that we've uh, identified in the year that we're working towards um, but definitely we continue to work in that in that direction yeah thank you I'll, I'll reach out to you further maybe to have some discussions on that and with Councillor thompson i think that's a really big piece of the puzzle that maybe you can have some more backing behind so thanks we appreciate that Thanks, Councillor Harris. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Conger. 
Thank you, Worship. Um, three, Mr. Ryan, I'll put on the lens of sitting on the Seniors Advisory um, Committee and having done some work in seniors' health in the past. And when I go back to your presentation on some of the demographics, I didn't see anything specific to seniors. Should you have data about seniors, I'd be interested or um, would welcome you to look at making a presentation to that committee. Some things come to mind that envelope into food insecurity that I've experienced working with senior populations. Some come down to uh, examples of when an individual's access to uh, in their own um, automobile and they start taking public transit, they've changed what they might buy in the grocery store based on weight and what they can actually manage to carry. Um, other pieces have been identified about when an individual might um, end up living on their own, they will prepare food and might be at greater risk of being malnourished because they're not um, really taking the initiative to look at um, fixing meals for themselves when they might have been preparing it for a partner. And so nutrition and I think food literacy might change depending on also the situation of um, how our lifestyle changes or what access to food looks like um, based on what may be a one's decision or not. But I was also looking at um, when we look at access to food, are those things considered at the, the council level? And do you have any data on seniors? Nothing specific on seniors. Um, often the discussion around basic household income um, goes back to seniors and how the supplement and CPP, um, we see when people are able to access those programs, we see household food insecurity lower. Um, definitely food literacy um, and um, the name escapes me now, but there is a program in um, uh, uh, Georgian Bay, South Georgian Bay, um, that was working on food skills. Um, and, and part of that, and, and that community kitchen idea, um, those would be great programs to run out of a community kitchen where um, people that are suffering from social isolation can come and, and learn to cook, cook a meal together, take, take leftovers home. Um, all these things are, you raise some really great points. Um, and there's definitely some overlap with lots of the programs that, um, lots of the issues that we're working towards. Yeah, thanks for your, the information you brought forward tonight. Thanks, Councillor Kungel. Uh, any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, Mike, Bonnie, you've been on the hot seat now for over an hour. Uh, congratulations on answering all those questions, Mike, and thank you both for being here to, uh, uh, to present on the work of the Food Council. Uh, we really do appreciate that, and uh, looking forward to being in touch with you uh, around the meeting upcoming in Barrie and, uh, and the further coordination of, of, uh, of services so nobody in our city need go hungry, and that is at the core of what we all want and, and are working towards. Uh, members of council, um, we do have another presentation and given the last one took over an hour, I'm suggesting we take a 10 minute break, uh, but it's up to you. Do you wanna continue on and just do the last presentation? Break, no break. No break, I'm seeing more no's than yeses. Here we go. All right, uh, our next presentation uh, be prepared, Dr. Westmoines and uh, Mr. Kansari. Uh, <laughs> uh, our next presentation is concerning an update on the college's operations, and uh, I'm very delighted to introduce uh, Der uh, Dr. Mary Lynn Westmoines and uh, Ali Kansari, who's the chair of the Board of Governors uh, at Georgian College, to give us an update on the college and a few of their activities over the last little while. So as they come into the call here, uh, I will thank you both uh, for your leadership during what it was, uh, has been, of course, the most difficult 18 months, I'm sure, for your organization, just like ours. And uh, welcome to City Council. The floor is yours. Well, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Lehman and council members. And uh, just let me thank you uh, for uh, staying with it tonight. And we're delighted uh, to have an opportunity to address council. I, it's been some time since we've been able uh, to join you and share with you some highlights about what's happening at your community uh, council. Um, I'm going to have to send greetings from our chair, Ali Kansari, who was called away, uh, but uh, please know that he had intended to be with us here tonight. 
no doubt it's been an extraordinary uh, 19 months, as you have suggested, uh, Mayor. Um, and I'm exceptionally proud of Georgian's collective uh, resolve. Uh, like you, we face many challenges. However, the college continues to thrive with approximately 9,000 new and returning students having joined us this fall remotely and in person or a combination of both. We have about a third of those students on, coming on campus for labs and practicums. And we're planning uh, for a greater on-campus presence this winter now that everyone on campus has to be vaccinated. And I can't tell you how we're looking forward to this uh, transition. Students have shown incredible resilience and I wanna publicly thank Georgian's faculty, staff and administrators and also all of our businesses and community partners who've made sure that students have been able to continue their studies for the last six semesters. So tonight I have a number of strategic priorities I'd like to share with you. And so next slide, please. Uh, given your earlier discussions, I thought it was very timely. So yes, the next slide, if you go to the next one now, please also. Um, given your earlier discussions, it is timely that I am able to review some highlights of Georgian's economic impact analysis that I shared with you earlier in the year. And this impact analysis shows how the college creates values in many ways and influences the lives of our students, employees, and regional economy. The study found that our campuses, that's all seven of them, contribute $1.7 in income to the Georgian catchment area economy, or approximately 5.3% of the total growth regional product. Of particular interest, $1.4 billion of that impact is generated by our alumni. In fact, about 49% of our graduates call Simcoe County home. Next slide, please. The campus contributes $702 million in income to the city of Barrie economy, supporting more than 9,000 city jobs. Student spending adds $64 million to the Barrie economy. The impact of our alumni currently employed in the workforce is close to $500 million within Barrie. And for every dollar a student invests in their education at Barrie campus, they'll gain about $1.8 in lifetime earnings. Next slide, please. I can, I've already said the Georgian team has worked exceptionally hard to support our students and community during the pandemic. It will interest council to know both campus buildings that the city has invested in, that's the Peter B. Moore Advanced Technology Center and the Sadland Center for Health, Wellness and Sciences have been hubbed of activity throughout the pandemic. Since August 2020, and with strict safety protocols in place, our health, wellness, and scientist center remained open to ensure students meeting were able to meet their learning outcomes in high demand health occupations. And the community has continued to have access to affordable health care through our student-led clinic. We've maintained close partnerships with all of our local long-term care settings, RVH, Nextdoor, and public health throughout the pandemic, and know we'll continue to do so in the future. So I know you've heard about loans of beds and equipment at the beginning of the pandemic and the role our students played in helping to manufacture temporary face shields. Um, but I want to underscore that the healthcare system has continued to take our students on placement and they recognize the need for that experience, as have employers continued to take all of our co-op students, ensuring that students could have real meaningful work experience in different ways uh, from time to time when we had to stay remote, but nevertheless, our partners stuck with us. Georgians also collaborated with Honda Manufacturing of Canada to produce the face shields for Stevenson Memorial Hospital. And we partnered with Kubota Materials Canada to utilize 3D printers to, plot, to provide um, and supply parts for masks and shields that were used much broader. 
I'll turn for a moment to our Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center um, department and the fact that they fast tracked our online remote strategy, which they had thought they would do over a five year period in the last two years. This allowed us to expand our reach, improve access for local business and help educate, inspire and activate more innovators and entrepreneurs. You know, I can't thank the city of Barry enough, um, who've been a key partner in establishing this regional business network. And we're grateful to the city and our partnership with the Economic and Creative Development Department as well, because it's helping Georgian to build capacity in key areas, including mentoring companies and expanding activity like our Further Faster program, innovation on co-ops, fostering more homegrown research and innovation pro projects with local industry partners to ensure they can continue to thrive, compete, and be more innovative post-pandemic. If I look back over the nine years, I'd say that together we've formed a strong entrepreneur innovation and research ecosystem together. And we're proud to be partners with the city as part of the development of that system. You may also be interested to know we had an overwhelming response in applications to our one time accelerated personal support worker program, which started in May. And this program does, is designed to get PSWs out into the field more quickly um, because they're so desperately needed. And more recently, over the summer and fall, we've worked with local health partners to provide immunization clinics at our, our campuses. Let me turn my attention to the ways we've had to evolve our ways of learning. So next slide, please. I could share many other highlights, but perhaps one of our biggest achievements during the pandemic has been the way we have approached learning. This is an ongoing journey. We know students expect more from their education and the pandemic made that obvious and reaffirmed our commitment to ensuring flexible experiment experiential and technology enabled learning. Our goal is to offer students more control over their personal learning journey, letting them decide now, how, where, and when they will study. We know employers are expecting this from our graduates as well. They've expressed a need to hire graduates with enhanced digital literacy, resilience, and problem solving. The support employers in the city of Barrie provide our students is incredible and keeps growing. And in fact, you yourself are an employer that takes on many of our students and I know they really appreciate having placements with you. There's an impressive number of co-op partnerships arrangements between Georgian and local organizations. And we appreciate all the referrals we regularly receive. So keep sending any co-op jobs our way or placement experiences for our students. We know higher education is poised for disruption and Georgian is ready and continues to lead. Next slide, please. Our journey has uh, focused us principally on three strategic priorities right now. And you can see them on the screen. The first is digital innovation, which is about creating an unrivaled student experience. Our goal is to offer flexible, personal, and technology-enabled learning and service and delivery throughout the entire student life cycle and beyond. We feel right from the moment a student is interested in coming to us, if we can capture them in a digital way, that after they graduate and they're working and want to continue in the life experience, we should be able to be a service for them and that will keep, help us be connected with them, but help ensure that they're able to continue on their learning journey. We have over 130 programs today at Georgian and we know that many sectors are being disruptive by automation, remote work and e-commerce and we must, absolutely must equip our students with the digital skill sets they need to succeed. And of course, our students will go in to work in some industries and help lead that disruption. 
Our second priority is equity, diversity, and inclusion and belonging. And we're striving to create a learning environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and know they belong. We were very fortunate to get a large grant from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada to do our work in this area. And our board has contributed to stabilize funding. So we've been able to hire our first ever Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Sula Levsky, who joined us just a couple of weeks uh, ago. And we look forward her, for her becoming part of our community. As our third priority um, is fostering an agile culture, which means being collaborative, continuously striving to improve and know it's safe to try new things and fail. This is something that we feel is critical for us to model for students. We need them to be change makers. We need them to be empowered graduates. And the best way that we can do this is by living these goals ourselves. Next slide, please. If you haven't already heard this, let me say it clearly. Georgian is very proud of the long standing partnership we have with the city of Barrie. It's long benefited our students, alumni, employers, and community. City investments in Georgian and our students have supported the creation of state-of-the-art facilities that are home to unprecedented levels of innovation. And uh, Mayor, I was at a meeting where people were talking about infrastructure in the province and someone reminded them that uh, we were the only place that had four levels of government when we built the um, Peter B. Moore Center. And I think that just speaks volumes to the partnerships our community has. And, and again, wanna thank uh, the city for their leadership in that. Throughout the pandemic, Georgian remained focused on student success and our commitment to the regions we serve to prepare the future leaders so our communities have the talent and experience workforce they need to grow, stay healthy and prosper. We listen to local employers and community and we're always open to more feedback so that we can understand what is going on with labor, how we can fill the skill gaps, how we can launch new programs to make sure that we are responsive to our community. Next slide, please. And of course, we were been successful recently uh, to take a large step forward around uh, talent for healthcare. We've known for a long time that there's a shortage, uh, even before COVID hit in degree nurses, and many of you have heard me talk about that I just didn't feel it was right that students from our community had to go to the GTA to uh, complete their degree. Not right for students who uh, couldn't do that. That meant they couldn't realize a dream of becoming a degree nurse, but not right for our community either. And that's why we were so pleased on October 7th, one of our very own local MPPs, Minister Jill Dunlop of Colleges and Universities announced the approval of our new four-year Honours Bachelor of Science degree in nursing that will begin uh, next September in both Barrie and Owen Sound. And what's so great about this program is it's a community-grown program. We've had local health professionals uh, providing us input uh, I want to assure everyone we have to go through the same regimental um, requirements and re uh, approvals that any university had to do, but we were able to build in our own community needs and focus on areas like gerontology, Indigenous and mental health. So. Folks, graduates will fill that nursing shortage from people from our community who want to study here, want to continue to make this their home. It's going to be a huge win for our shared healthy future. This, of course, will require an investment, and I want to begin by recognizing that here in Barrie, as the city very know, well knows, uh, bringing all four years of BSCN to the campus fulfills a promise we made when we opened the Sadland Center. 
At the time of its opening in 2011, the center was fully equipped with state-of-the-art simulation labs, but with technology, no doubt you will understand it's time to refurbish them. And so we will do some transformational investment and have launched a fundraising campaign to do that. Our hospitals, long-term care centers and other organizations deserve new staff who are trained in modern day nursing practice and who appreciate the complexities and special needs of our community. Next slide, please. So you can see it's been an exciting time for us and this pandemic has only just strengthened our innovative spirit and deepened our commitment to being responsive, collaborative and meeting the needs of our region. We're so proud to be a part of uh, the Barry community. Our success, our students' success is our shared success. And I know we can continue to turn opportunities into long-term benefits. Thanks for your time this evening. And Mr. Mayor, I'm prepared to answer any questions that come my way. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Westmoines, and uh, we appreciate the, the update and the long uh, hours that have been put in in trying to pivot uh, towards educating uh, the workforce for both the needs of the immediate and the future uh, during COVID. Uh, questions for Dr. Wismoynes? Councillor Congo. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a quick question, I'm not sure if you're able to, to speak to it this evening, but specific to Barry and area, I recall that one of the programs that was presented to the Seniors Advisory Council just before COVID was the Home Share program that looked at uh, matching students to uh, seniors or individuals that had excess housing around supporting one, reducing social isolation, some really great uh, connections, but also then supplying some housing stock. Is that program one that will look to start up or continue through 2022? I think it was paused. Yeah, I, I, I believe um, that we did do some activity um, and um, uh, I'd be happy to get an update as to whether or not we'll be able to resume. I know students um, did some neat things. In fact, uh, students um, had dinner with some seniors. Um, uh, was one of the last things that I had heard about that um, uh, before um, COVID uh, prevented uh, people from coming together. So. Um, let me let me get an update and we'll share that with county clerk for you. Um, I have one last quick question, but it's kind of a compliment framed as a question. So I had the benefit of um, actually meeting many of your Georgian College students at the mass immunization clinics and they were amazing, uh, yes. amazing resources that um, um, had great experiences there um, when I asked them about that. Now that the clinics have changed around how we're doing immunizations and locations. Can you share any information about um, how students may or may not still be involved in supporting immunization efforts? Great question. Um, I don't believe our students are as active as they were before, although um, I will say that uh, it's now flu time and our students generally have a flu vaccination. so. Uh, I expect they're turn their head to that, but you know, as the need for um, vaccinations uh, seems to be um, not needed, thankfully, I, I know we still have a little ways to go. I don't think they are as actively involved unless they're on a placement where that activity is is going on. And of course, you know, many of our students continue to volunteer in so many different ways in healthcare and community roles. So. Um, I'm sure that if there's a new need, our students will pivot to it. Um, but if anyone hears of a way our students can assist, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. I have no further comments. And by the way, I love when I hear that our students are our best representatives in the community. <laughs> Councillor Reepma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and. Um, uh, Dr. Westmoyens, thanks very much. Um, congratulations on, on your uh, nursing um, program. Uh, I know that you've been working on that for a long, long time, and uh, it's great to see that uh, you've been successful there. Um, I, I noticed that in your presentation that um, there was no ask, 
and I kind of appreciate that. Uh, I know it's an update, but I just wonder, um, do you have any suggestions as to how the city can support Georgian College uh, more extensively or any suggestions in terms of how we grow the uh, partnership between the city and the college and the community? Well, we've, um, we've certainly got a few irons in the fire with the city. And, um, uh, you know, first of all, uh, if I might, um, I just want to thank uh, Council and, and you in particular for your ongoing support with Town and Gown. Um, I know that was discussed earlier and it's an important aspect of building uh, community relations. Uh, we have a shared initiative on busing that had to pause. I'm anticipating uh, with uh, renewed on-campus activity, we'll be able to get that going and um, always making sure that the routes are uh, representative of what our students need um, uh, is something that you know we've been working closely uh, with city city staff on, and I I'll, I'll add as well the work that we do together on you know some of the task force around um, moving forward um, coming out of the pandemic and economic recovery and then. Finally, I think we have a shared uh, goal around equity, diversity, inclusion, and respecting Indigenous people. So, you know, we do lots of work work together. Um, and so you're right, today I came with a huge thank you for that work. Um, and if there's something you think we should be doing together, happy, happy to explore that. Thanks, Councillor Reitma. And thanks, Dr. West Moines, actually. I appreciate that answer. Councillor Morales. Thank you, Mary Lehman. I hadn't indicated, but you read my mind. <laughs> Still got to change that password. Uh, uh, Ms. West Moines, I just wanted to start, uh, like Councillor Congo, uh, you, you know, to be blunt, your leadership has been transformative for the gr not only for the growth of the college, but for the reputation. I can think of a time when George Georgian College was kind of like that college in the suburbs that you could go to. Now it's on the short list for colleges you want to go to, and not just for uh, automotive, but for a plethora of programs, um, and that's, that's huge. Uh, so kudos to that. My questions start with seeing your slide about um, the creation of the nursing program. Um, do you have a number of beds of student housing that the college uh, is committing to building for the creation of the increase in the nursing program? I don't know how you got from housing, from uh, nursing to housing, but that was an interesting segue. Um, uh, well, you know, let me let me maybe get into that a little bit. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we had about 11,000 students at all seven of our campuses. Throughout um, uh, the last couple of semesters, we've had 9,000. So, you know, right now, we certainly have housing vacancies in uh, student purpose build housing. So I, you know, I want to I want to put that on the table, and um, you know, we'll probably go back to 9,000 students in the winter, and uh, we were at about 11,000 students uh, before the pandemic began. So um, I I would say it's going to be easily two years before we go back to full capacity in enrollment. Uh, so I want to. I want to put that on on the table. Um, I know it was referenced that we did have a, a good meeting uh, with yourself, um, uh, Councillor Greetma, and and the mayor. Um, and you know we're always open to having a discussion uh, about how we can improve housing for our students. Um, it's part of a systemic issue around housing, affordable housing for a community, and I, I totally understand understand that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of strategies uh, that can be uh, deployed um, um, and lots of opportunity, I think, for community development um, that might be a mechanism to address this opportunity, because I call it an opportunity and I go back to the economic impact that um, having a college in our community affords. And not just that, um, every day I talk to an employer, they're talking about talent needs and shortages. So, um, you know, happy to have further conversation 
about how we can come up with some strategies to uh, to address address the matter. So, Ms. Westmore, uh, Dr. Westmoyne, so the best strategy for that, and I agree with you, is building more purpose-built student housing. So does the college or the board not have a number in mind? And, and just to clarify my question, because you said how did we get from uh, a nursing program to housing, nursing program uh, means more heads need beds. So heads and beds is the term used in the industry. Uh, so just to clarify, there's no number at the moment of new construction that the college uh, is committing uh, to building for this entire no. new program? No, we don't. And and I want to be clear, I, I if you heard me say that I think the best approach is uh, to build more student housing, I'm not sure that's the case right now. So I don't want to be inter misunderstood um, by council. I think there's a number of studies that need to be done and some review to to uh, be under undertaken. Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I think also it's important that uh, we're thoughtful on how how we we move forward in this. I, I just I want to say to you right now that I know that Georgian Green, which is across the street from us, is only operating at 20% uh, right now, 20% capacity. I think they have 650 beds, and they've got about 200 students in there. So it it. Uh, more complicated than just building more student purposed housing. So to go on a point, I had another question here, to go on a point that you just said, uh, studies need to be made and we need to see how post COVID the absorption and, and, and people coming back is going to play out. Obviously nobody wants to build too much, nobody wants to build too little and have the neighborhood be holding the bag at the end of the day. Um, would it not be prudent for the, uh, the, the, the Jordan College Board to hold off on creating this program until they know the stabilization of a housing stock uh, and then be able to adequately roll out the program once they have a better idea? Because at the end of the day, it's not going to be Georgian College themselves that has too much vacancy or a long waiting list. It's going to be the neighboring communities that will absorb it and will uh, exasperate the existing problem. So wouldn't it be prudent to wait for those for that rollout to happen, specifically since this is an expansion program, not an existing one? Well, a couple of uh, points on 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 that. Um, you know, um, housing is an important aspect uh, from a college perspective and something that is done right through this country in partnership with our community. Um, many, many uh, homeowners, uh, many developers um, have been very successful in providing um, uh, homes uh, for, for students and get profit uh, from doing that. And as you've noted, we do have our own residences. We have homestay. We have a number of mechanisms where our students um, can find, uh, find accommodation. So there isn't one shoe fits all. And I would say with the looming health shortage and the predicted shortage of nurses, we would not want to uh, delay the start of this very, very important uh, program. Perfect, no, that's, that's a fair answer. Um... You said that it's it's more than just housing. Um, I don't know if you had tuned in uh, to the earlier chat about bylaw enforcement. Uh, if you did, uh, welcome to government. My apologies. Uh, but if, as part of that greater commitment to you know Georgian supporting the community, the community supporting Georgian, um, do you think there's a conversation to be had about Georgian um, cost sharing, uh, the the costs of those implementation programs? And I don't just mean you know you guys pay the tab for bylaw for the city of Barrie. That wouldn't be equitable. Uh, if our staff themselves, and data is getting better every day, if our staff themselves can specifically link uh, uh, responsive staff to incidents, specifically uh, to student-centric houses, um, that we can really kind of come back to you and present that, uh, would the board uh, be willing to step up and, uh, I guess, in, not in the housing solution, but uh, cost share those uh, expenses for the uh, neighboring uh, taxpayers? At this time, um, you know, uh, always open to discussion and dialogue, but we've, we've had this conversation in the past, and I guess I'll frame it uh, this way. Um, 
In my job as president is to provide a learning experience, higher education learning experience for our students. And this community benefits in the ways that were already shared by the economic impact study, uh, as well as that we provide talent for you know, the majority of uh, workers in our community are graduates of Georgian, Georgian College. So uh, that asset to you, I think, is incredibly important going forward from an economic impact analysis, never mind, you know, the well-being of our, our community. Um, we have lots of businesses who work in different ways, and some rent out their apartments. It's not my business to monitor how individuals rent out their apartments um, for people who um, come from any walk of life. And that would be people who can afford the best uh, condominium in our community or who um, are students living in a number of different places. That's not my sole responsibility, but I certainly am always willing to have conversations with the city on how to move, move forward. Um, so I've shared with you a couple of things that we've done to ensure that we've been working collaboratively with the city um, to make sure, uh, you know, the busing being a prime example. I think that was very mutually beneficial to the college and the city. And I'll also just remind a few of you that know that, you know, there is a tax uh, that the city receives for every student um, that we have here at the college that uh, goes uh, to the city uh, in, in recognition of having a community college in their community. And um, that's where I would encourage you to look to find the funding. I appreciate that, Ms. Westmoyens. I think the reason, the origin of my questions here are, are, we saw in your slide, we saw $5 million, and I'm sure it was an accident, the undated check, $5 million of taxpayer dollars for a great capital uh, program for you guys to grow. Um, so when that occurs, there's there's some skin in the game for 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 uh, property taxpayers uh, about how to uh, you know get value and I love the I love the points that you had about economic development and about jobs and about the local economy those are that there's a reason why that was number one or two um, but again when we're writing those major capital checks and I know you're not asking for money now what would you say to residents that say with more students um, comes more bodies in Barrie. And if there's no housing, no increase in housing, either on campus or responded by the market, um, which again, you, you, you address that point. In Guelph, the private market has responded and they have made money and the issue is basically under control. Same thing in KW and Waterloo. But in Barrie, that's not the case. Uh, it's, it's not your job necessarily to solve the private market, of course, but it is uh, the board, the board of, uh, of Georgian College to address the fact that if they're bringing more bodies and the private market isn't responding uh, and the spillover effect uh, and, you know, Councillor Reitma, Councillor Ainsworth, Councillor Smith, Councillor Ramsey before him continue to be raked over the coals with no solution in sight, what would you say to residents uh, that the college can um, qualm their concerns and address their concerns about uh, 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 standard uh, of living um, sure. and property standards. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and again, you know, just because you're quoting some of my numbers and I want to make sure you're quoting them correctly, you know, we've got about 9,000 students now. Uh, at peak, we had 11,000. So um, at, at this point, uh, adding a nursing program is not going to be a challenge for us in the short term. And uh, we will not be able to recruit students if we do not have housing arrangements uh, for them. So, um, you know, it has not been a problem the last uh, three or four, four years. I, I think the problem has been um, uh, some concerns. And, and if I could just say this, you know, I attend a meeting with 24 college presidents uh, every six weeks. And um, I used to work at a university, as you know, and I would say you are experiencing the same problems that exist in other communities that have higher education living with them. Um, uh, Councilor Lincoln did a lot of research to find out best practices. He put a couple before. I know you've just voted on an approach going 
going forward. Um, but, but this is not a problem that's unique to Barry. I don't want everyone to think it is. And, um, you know, together, I think we have to continue to work on it um, because, you know, I would hate for people listening to this to think that the majority of uh, our students are not good residents or that they live in facilities where landlords don't pay attention to them because that's not the case. We know the majority are good tenants and we know the majority of landlords are good to our students. So. I think we're dealing with the people that don't follow the rules. And as always, I know uh, from, from your perspective, that's where you've got to pay some attention. So again, happy to have discussions on how we can collectively solve these problems. Thank you, uh, Dr. West Moines. Um, again, so Councilor Morales, um, seen lots of body language around the table. Maybe one more question, and then we'll move on to other questions. I'm just okay. going to thank her for her transformative leadership, and uh, looking forward to seeing the, the commitment beyond the boundary with Cook Street. Thank you, Dr. West Moines. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Councilor Morales. Councilor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, hello, Miss Doctor uh, Doctor Miss West Moines. Um, Mayor. Hi, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say as Georgian College alumni and as an instructor with Georgian College for nine years, um, congratulations on your upcoming retirement. And you are a leader in this community that I've definitely always looked up to. I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the years and I just wish you all the best in, in your future. Thank you, thank you. I have eight more months of work to do but uh, looking uh, forward to the transition. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, other questions? Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, to you, to Ms. Westmoines. Uh, Ms. Mes Ms. Westmoines, thanks for the presentation. Um, I had a couple questions. The um, congratulations on the nursing program, it, but uh, noting it, um, being a batch of sciences, that's a positive, but it made me think of the um, uh, changes a few years back, I guess it was around 2017 when uh, Laurentian parted ways, and I believe the partnership might have been, um, the vacancy might have been filled by Lakehead, who has a nursing program. So I'm just curious, um, it made me think about um, where things are in relation to adding degree programs, which of course the nursing one is, but it's not a Lakehead, it's a Georgian standalone. So where is Georgian at with um, increasing its degree programs and university partnerships? And is Lakehead still a key partner filling that, that vacancy that Laurentian uh, left? Thank yeah, you. we have, um, you know, we have uh, four programs, four degree programs uh, with Lakehead and enrollment is uh, continually growing. We have two more programs under review and development. It takes a fair amount of time to launch a degree program. And um, I, I would encourage you all to watch with interest um, uh, as um, the next uh, six months unfold, uh, because colleges have asked uh, the government to allow us to move forward with three year degrees on our own. Um, you know, uh, this is uh, the 60th year of colleges in our province and I think our track record on degrees is uh, gaining considerable recognition because we come to the degree table recognizing both the theory and the applied that's needed and employers are very eager for our graduates so um, we'll continue to do our own degrees uh, four-year degrees uh, continue with the Lakehead uh, partnership um, and also we're exploring three-year degrees as something to pursue. Great, thank you. And um, yeah, certainly our community, as I, st I still believe the largest university, a campus, uh, uh, largest city without a campus in Canada, I think I still have that uh, unfortunate uh, um, kind of uh, an, uh, attachment to our community. Just curious, um, we had a pre presentation, it was really interesting, um, uh, I think about a month ago from uh, Dr. Moffat from the Ivy School of Business and he talked about um, um, housing and uh, its relation to education. And, and, I, and I, if I'm correct, I, I mean, Georgian's made some significant um, advancements in attracting international students and 
certainly the good news is that many stay because they, they get, get trained in Canada, they have the credentials to uh, gain employment here and they add to the skilled uh, workforce here, which is a wonderful thing. But it, as Mr. Dr. Moffat explained, it creates a lot of pressure on housing. And I'm wondering with, if I have the numbers correct, I, I think it, last I heard was something like a third of the students in Georgia are international students, which is incredible. And I'm wondering, you know, coming from uh, across the world is, is one of the concerns for Georgia and having housing, uh, you know, a good uh, quality housing for international students, is it part of the package um, to be able to help them? And, and I guess maybe further to Council Morales' points is, is part of that long-term future with the growth of international students housing part of that um, attraction and uh, responsibility to ensure they have a good place to live? Yeah, um, well, um, I think housing is an important discussion for all of our students. So, you know, uh, about 50% of our students um, uh, commute and the other 50% um, are looking for housing. And so, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're coming from um, uh, Wawa, where I was born, um, or from somewhere in India, you know, housing is an important, important aspect. Um, uh, uh, I've been looking at the forecasts around um, labor in our country, and um, uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Moffat was clear to point out to you that if we don't have a very good in immigration strategy, we will not have the talent we need to continue the workforce that we need. Uh, the demographics of uh, individuals um, in Simcoe and Gray and Bruce um, that are, are between the ages of 18 and uh, 30 uh, will continue to decrease until about 20. Um, that was pre-pandemic, so we don't know the impact of what's happened as a result of some of the housing changes in the last uh, two years, uh, but I would doubt it would have clarified that void for us. So I, I think um, that housing is going to be an important aspect for our community to address and, and certainly the college will be an important part of that. Yeah, thank you. And just to, just to be clear, I do appreciate and uh, support the international student uh, um, a focus that Georgian has taken. I understand that completely. Just which I'm, I'm curious about is maybe on that end, has there been any uh, consultation and um, uh, evaluation with students uh, if the housing is not meeting the needs and, and there's vacancies? Has there been, is that part of the process to say, hey, listen, maybe student housing, what it was when I went to uh, Laurier has probably changed the expectations, or maybe it's gone backwards. Maybe they don't want as a big, as big a units that cost so much more money. Is, is that, is the need changing? And is well, there any, yeah. I love, I love this question because it, it allows me to answer and we're going to go full circle on this, right? Um, students are savvy. They're going to pay or create an environment uh, so that they can spend as little as they absolutely possibly can on housing as the person that's renting the accommodation to them will allow them to do. And we're going to go full circle on the debate here because you know, it's not it's not safe to have too many students living in houses that aren't set set up for that. Um, and um, uh, but we have all different kinds of housing, as you just said. If if you were at Waterloo for uh, university, you know there were you know apartments, there were apartments in uh, building complexes, there were residences, and there was homestay, and um, that's that diversified approach will continue. But if you ask a student what's the most important thing about housing while you're going to school is affordability. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll leave it at that and thank you for your time. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Any other questions? Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Ms. Westmoines, I just have uh, one. And that is, I mean, over the years, uh, Georgian has pivoted, uh, overused verb now, changed its programming uh, to adjust to changes in the local economy. 
And in the last two years, you had to do that in a very accelerated fashion to respond to specific needs due to COVID. And I think the PSW um, quick program and then the, the nurse, nursing expansion is a, a huge um, move in that direction. But I guess I would ask you where, where you see yeah, um, tying those things together going forward. Because, you know, as we come out of COVID now, we're in this situation in Ontario where we have shortages in a wide variety of sectors. Um, and, you know, where that's not really about a skills gap, you're right, it's about immigration and wages and the reasons why people do and don't work or take jobs in certain areas and don't take others, working conditions. Where Georgian comes in is training the workforce for tomorrow and everything from construction trades, which has been a, a perennial shortage for the last 10 years, to, to newer shortages. <laughs> um, where do you see Georgian um, Maybe you could give us a little bit more on where you see Georgian going next to try and support the growth of the local labor market uh, and the specific demands that our businesses uh, and the economy have here. Great, great uh, question. As all questions ha have been, you, you, re you warned me about getting ready for the question uh, period, Mayor. So I'm glad for these questions and glad for the interest by all council uh, members tonight. Yeah, it, uh, you know, there isn't a program <laughs> that I can think of that we're running where employers aren't telling us there's a shortage right right now. So I think that's a key element and where we're focusing our energy in those programs is making sure that our students are ready for the disruption that's occurring in almost every single industry. And so technology and uh, technology enhancement, automation, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether you're in that program or you're in a computer program. Um, you know, uh, Mayor, I think we have to shine a light on this digital world that we're we're living in, so that our graduates can compete and help our our local economy in all kinds of ways. Um, lots of growth in our tech programs in the last uh, two years. I'll, I'll just uh, put that on the table. Lots of interest and, of course, high demand jobs. I was in a call with the Committee of Presidents where um, I know of three large employers who are about to come together to sort of trade off technology specialties um, because they're having shortages and they feel maybe they can address those shortages by sharing some staff around. And um, so I think we'll continue to turn our heads that way. And then I'm going to put on the table this new topic of micro credentials, which are short, specific, focused credential that will allow someone to come in and focus. But you can build these credentials towards a larger uh, diploma or a degree. And that's certainly one of our areas that we're focusing on. Okay, thank you very much, as always, for answering all these questions. And uh, Councillor Natalie Harris, I uh, want to congratulate you on your announcement. Uh, although it will be a tremendous loss for our community, uh, I noticed um, uh, at the time uh, that uh, we do still have some time together uh, to continue uh, the work that we've done together between the city and the college to, to grow education in our community. But uh, you've done uh, just an incredible amount of work over nine years at the helm uh, introducing I think it's 37 new programs um, you're probably too modest to include that number in your presentation but I uh, it, it is under your leadership that that has occurred and and I believe the uh, expansion into new areas of education has followed the needs of our economy and the needs of our community so closely um, and I would also highlight while you're here that uh, you know the city of Barrie's work with the college over the years um, you know there were capital projects that we were excited to collaborate on but it's the staff level work that's on a constant and ongoing basis um, that allows us to continue to be such strong partners uh, and you know your staff work whether it's our transit staff our economic development staff um, even our, our programming folks and our planning folks um, it's a, it's a remarkable partnership and it benefits our community uh, and I, the last thing I do want to say, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of council here, but certainly um, from myself as well, uh, you know, the uh, Georgian College is one of our largest employers in the community, 
and Georgians' staff uh, have had to adapt to a very difficult new reality from the people who work in facilities to the executive uh, management team to the teaching staff uh, to the support and administrative staff and the college has such a remarkable workforce. So uh, if you would convey our thanks uh, because as a partner in the community uh, I know they have all been asked to do very difficult, make very difficult changes uh, and also in an environment where um, uh, tough choices unfortunately uh, were forced upon us at times. Uh, so I appreciate your leadership, uh, thank you for being here and I, uh, but also please convey back to uh, the team at Georgian uh, how much we appreciate the, the work that was done by your team to get through the last 18 months and still be looking forward to a stronger future. So we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay, good night. Uh, okay, members of council brings us to inquiries. Any inquiries of staff, Deputy Mayor Ward? No. Members of council, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'll be real quick. Uh, maybe just to maybe uh, our treasurer, or, uh, Craig Miller. Uh, very long range financial plan. We had a presentation by uh, Gary Scanling, and I understand that he may be coming back um, <clears throat> on November 1st. And he, uh, there's a series of questions that we asked, that I asked specifically about getting maybe best practices from municipalities. Has that information been brought back to you at all? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to uh, Councillor McCann. Um, I believe we do have some Im information provided in the report that's coming from uh, Mr. Scanlon. Um, and uh, we will, if it's not, I'll, I'll, I'll be double checking, but the plan is to have it on council for next week, November 1st. Okay, so there has been some correspondence then with Gary and uh, information should be coming back in this week. Thank you. Other inquiries of staff, members of council. Okay, seeing none, announcements, Deputy Mayor Ward. I have none. Members of council, Councillor Congle. Thank you, Your Worship. I have one announcement, and it's appreciation to staff with some good maybe public messaging. So at the Seniors Advisory Committee, today we uh, had the benefit of hearing from staff and transit services. So a great reminder that Thursdays are free fare for seniors. And a shout out um, that happened at the committee to Molly Malcolm, who years ago, I believe, had been a huge advocate uh, around um, free fare for seniors and led to that outcome. So again, thank you, Molly. Uh, I did want to express my appreciation, and I'm not sure if other members of council are aware of this or members of the public, um, but it came to our attention through the transit conversations around the exceptional work staff uh, did. So Jason uh, Zimmerman and uh, Julie McDonald uh, gave uh, a lot of information about transit on demand. So I know in Little Lake, we've had a lot of conversations around getting to the medical center, uh, how to look at other routes, and there is a wealth of information about um, if you want to request staff, they will help do training and information. So whether you're a retirement home or maybe a service program or center, if it could benefit individuals who are looking for transportation and adopting public transit, you can actually reach out through ServiceBerry and ask staff to reach out to organizations to share how to plan a route and how to use some new apps uh, should technology be available to actually look at um, transit on demand. So uh, an amazing amount of work done, in particular uh, to the whole transit team. 75% um, of our fleet uh, is now outfitted with an onboarding, deboarding uh, technology for individuals that are wheelchair users. Before now, it was only, I believe, two buses out of our fleet. We're at 75% going to 100%, so I just want to compliment staff on that. And uh, for those that might not be aware, please do ask about that when you're booking for transit. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I may just take uh, two minutes here. Um, it is 1040, and I recognize there will be very few kids watching council uh, right now. But I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, make a statement or say something uh, to council and to the rest of the city of Barrie. I'm involved with a, with a uh, charitable organization called Rotary. I'm sure most people know what it's about. And, uh, you know, they think global and they act local. I can give two examples of what they've done. I just heard uh, from a presentation from a, a senior member that Part of their passion at Rotary is to end polio around the world. And I was happily shocked to believe there's only two countries left in the whole entire world that actually have wild polio cases. And that's Afghanistan and that's um, Pakistan. And with the turmoil going on in, that, in both of those countries, Rotary is still going in 
to end the fight. And I won't go into too much detail, but it's been 10 months and they've had one case each, I believe, for wild polio. So I know it's not on all of our lists or our top of our minds, but this organization does great work. And so I said, you know, think globally and act locally. Now comes the local. Councillor Robert Thompson, what are you dressing up next Saturday? <laughs> so, the, so Rotary is doing a great event uh, for kids and for people with kids at heart. Uh, down at Meridian Place this Saturday from 11 till 3, they're having a Halloween competition and a Halloween contest for everybody. This is a free event. You can go online if you have a pumpkin carving, if you've got a front door, if you've got a house that you've, uh, that you've um, dressed up for Halloween, please enter into this competition. There's some great prizes by Napoleon, some great prizes by Bradford Greenhouses, where you can win barbecues, fireplaces, uh, and uh, gift cards to, the, um, to the, uh, the greenhouse. And also, the kids are gonna all get a chance to have their pumpkin carving. Uh, there's gonna be costume contests, all the pizzas downtown Barry, uh, Jimmy Choo's pizza, pie, I'm missing two, um, 147 is entering. They're actually gonna have a competition on who has the best pizza downtown Barry. I think pie is gonna actually try to shove a whole pizza in your mouth, have a competition like that. So is this a little ridiculous? Yes, of course it is. But is it fun? Of course it is. So please, anybody who's got their house uh, dressed up for Halloween, please encourage them to enter the contest. And this is a, uh, an event that uh, I'm, gonna be I'm gonna be going to, and I would just uh, encourage everybody and anybody to come down and have some fun. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor McCann. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, Councilor McCann just saved me one about the 30th. Uh, I'd like to proclaim October 2021 as International Dyslexia Awareness Month. November 2021 is Children's Grief Awareness Month. Uh, the City of Barrie is seeking to appoint two citizen members to the Active Transportation and Sustainability Advisory Committee. The term of office is until mid-November of next year. Application forms are available at barryca slash committee vacancies due by Friday, November 5th. We're also accepting nominations for the 2021 Heritage Awards to recognize property owners and individuals who've made strides in fostering local identity through heritage preservation and awareness within Barrie. Nominations will be accepted there until Friday, November 26th. Uh, more information on the website. The Barry Market Precinct Task Force is asking for feedback from residents to help inform the planning process for a new permanent market in the west end of downtown Barry. Residents are encouraged to provide feedback through an online survey closing Sunday, November 21st. Survey is available at barry.ca slash permanent market. And I did just want to note, um, we've had three major uh, sort of online surveys in the last little while, uh, Performing Arts Center, the Market Precinct Task Force and our budget allocator, we are getting a tremendous response from the public to these surveys. Thank you so much to uh, now more than 700 people who filled out each of the uh, West End and the Performing Arts Center task forces, uh, and more than 1,200 or 1,300, I believe, uh, folks who use the budget allocator already. This is very helpful to Council, uh, and it's a sign of an engaged community, which is really great to see. Uh, the 2021 annual Christmas card art contest is now open. You can submit your holiday scene painting, drawing, or photo depicting a Barry scene or event. Uh, entry forms are available online at barry.ca slash card contest. Uh, this one's very exciting. Based on the success we had with a June virtual job fair, this is for people looking for employment in the city of Barry. And as we know, uh, there are lots of jobs out there right now and some shortages in certain sectors. Uh, but there are jobs out there and there are people looking for them and we want to help you find them if you are looking for employment. So the City of Barrie is once again going to partner with the county uh, to run a fall work in Simcoe County virtual job fair. And this will be Tuesday, November 9th, 10 until 2. The online event will be uh, using a friendly, a user-friendly platform called Brazen. Uh, so it's a, it's a web link that, that uh, takes you onto this platform where uh, job seekers and employers can connect one-on-one -on -one text chat, audio, and video registration is now open and free for both people seeking a job and employers. So uh, we're hosting this platform, collaborating with the County of Simcoe uh, to provide access for folks to jobs that are available in Barrie and to help our businesses find their workforce. Uh, you can visit workinsimcoecounty.ca to learn more and register today. So again, that's Tuesday, November 9th, 10 to 2 online job fair. Ontario Minor Hockey, and this is also very exciting, Ontario Minor Hockey Association and our rec department, along with Tourism Barrie, 
are very pleased to announce, we, it was a press release today, we're going to host the provincial championships uh, here in Barrie, within the city of Barrie, April 1st to April 3rd, 2022, and April 8th to April 10th, 2022. So congratulations to the team on working with the OMHA. It's a major honor for us to host the best young hockey players uh, in the province, and we will all be looking forward to seeing that here in Barrie in April of next year. Battery Collection Week will be taking place November 1st to 5th in partnership with Simcoe County. You should have received your collection bags uh, delivered to Barrie households last week. What you do is you put your dead batteries in the bag, put it out beside your recycling bin on your regular collection day. That's the safe way to dispose of all those dead batteries. Uh, and I did mention the budget um, allocator tool, and although we've had a great response, we're still looking for all the input we can get. So folks, you can use the budget allocator. Um, uh, it is online uh, at barry.ca slash budget, and the results will, of course, be shared with all of us as part of the budget deliberations. Uh, I think that's enough for tonight. Um, planning committee will be meeting tomorrow, October 26th at 7. We've got city building, I believe, before that from 6 till 7, yeah. So city building tomorrow at 6, planning committee tomorrow at 7, uh, Monday, November 1st. And with that, we'll go to the bylaws. Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that leave be granted to introduce <coughs> the following bill, and this bill be read a first, second, and third time to stay and finally pass, Bill 91. Moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that leave be granted to introduce the following bill, and this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day, and finally pass. Bill 91, comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favour of Bill 91? Anybody opposed? Bill 91 carries. Bill 92, please, Deputy Moved Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that leave be granted to introduce the following bill, and this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day, and finally pass. Bill 92, the confirmation bylaw. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that this that leave be granted to introduce the following bill. And this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day, and finally pass Bill 92, the confirmation bylaw. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favour of Bill 92. Anybody opposed? That carries. Can I have a motion to adjourn City Council? Councillor Jim Harris, seconded by Councillor Gary Harvey. We are adjourned, and we will see you tomorrow night. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I haven't got to do that in a year and a half. That felt really good. We're adjourned.